Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, another uh, half-day Wilmick seminar. Our seminar today is a joint uh, effort uh, with Wilmick and the State Bar Young Lawyers Division. So I want to thank the YLD for all the work they've put in uh, to make this happen. Uh, and also the State Bar of Wisconsin, uh, specifically the Wislap program and Mary Spranger. So thank you to them uh, for all the hard work they've put in to make this happen. Uh, we're going to talk about wellness today, attorney wellness, um, and the strategies and barriers to, to help uh, uh, make us uh, uh, good, healthy people and help serve our clients. And we have a good uh, panel of speakers today. I want to welcome those who are watching on the web. We have about 150 people watching on the web today. Um, and for you web viewers, uh, you should have a link on your screen that allows you to submit questions and comments to us in real time. Uh, we will take those questions as they come in, and our speakers will uh, be happy to respond to those uh, as, the, as we get them. So um, please feel free on the web uh, to submit those questions if you'd like. Uh, this uh, program today uh, will run till about noon. We have been approved for three ethics credits, so those are uh, all approved and taken care of, so you do have that uh, to, uh, to claim for your uh, credit reporting. Um, so the first hour, uh, we have uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Abby Lindemann, with us. Uh, Dr. Lindemann is a contemplative psychologist. She currently works at the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin in Madison here. Uh, Dr. Lindemann's career focus is the integration of contemplative practice and theory with uh, clinical science, including curriculum and program development, teaching, and research. Uh, Dr. Lindemann holds a PhD in counseling psychology from UW-Madison, an MA from Naropa University in contemplative psychology. Uh, Naropa, for those of you who are wondering, is in Colorado. Uh, she also has a BA from the University of Pennsylvania in psychology. She is trained in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and mindfulness-based childbirth and parenting, and as a facilitator in an international mediation community. She provides mediation programs in person and online, uh, locally and internationally. So I want to uh, welcome Dr. Lindman to our program, and uh, uh, please uh, welcome her as well. Dr. Lindman. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. <clears throat> uh, just to to clarify one thing, um, I do uh, meditation training internationally. I'll leave the mediation okay. training uh, and the mediation practice to all of you, but perhaps a, a place where our work overlaps a bit as well. Um, so it's wonderful to be here with you all. Um, as uh, my introduction stated, I'm Abby Lindman. I'm a psychologist um, and a researcher at the Center for Healthy Minds, where we're focused on a scientific understanding of the mind and how to cultivate well-being. Uh, so the premise of me being here today is, um, I think, a wonderful one. I think it's a really great thing that this is something that's being prioritized as it relates to ethics, but as it relates to uh, living a meaningful life and doing what we can do during our time on this earth um, to be good to ourselves and to be good to others. So uh, very happy to be here. I'm going to start with a basic frame of why we are here talking today, talk a little bit about lawyers in particular and why this work is relevant to lawyers. And then we're going to spend a lot of this presentation actually engaging in some of the practices for cultivating well-being that we found in our research are really uh, beneficial and have a whole host of positive outcomes um, on the physical level, on the psychological level, and on the relational level as well. So a lot of our time together this morning, I'm going to invite you to look at your mind and your experience and to practice some of these skills. So that's our territory for today. And I'm open to questions, but we'll try to make sure to leave some time at the end so we can cover questions as well. So as we start this conversation, uh, we can start with the basic premise that we all want to be happy. We have different ways of approaching happiness. We have different um, views of what happiness looks like, but we all fundamentally want to be happy. Now, uh, often we think of this in terms of pursuing positive emotions. So we want to feel good. And the way we refer to this is kind of hedonic pleasure or hedonic happiness, a sense of happiness that's derived um, from things going the way we want and things feeling good. And uh, we can't control what happens to us. So ultimately, as a strategy, although this is helpful at times, 
um, when we go through difficulties, when things are challenging, when we have uh, clients, coworkers, family members that we have struggles and challenges with, we need some other way to think about happiness. And um, what we've found in our research as well is that there's another approach to happiness, uh, eudaimonic well-being or eudaimonic happiness that takes into account how we're living our lives in accordance with our values or how we're making meaning of what happens in our lives. So the struggles, the difficulties aren't seen as an obstacle to happiness or flourishing, but are actually seen as something that we can, uh, we can look at, we can frame, we can relate to in ways that are conducive to health and happiness. So just expanding a bit from, from the get-go, that uh, being happy and living a life of wellness and well-being does not mean always feeling good. And uh, often that's a helpful place to start the conversation. Um, not that there isn't tremendous, enduring, positive feeling that comes out of a eudaimonic pursuit of well-being. Uh, there's, there's a sense of more enduring well-being that we can cultivate when we're looking at that sense of meaning as well. So I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go on. Um, the other premise that I want us to start with has to do with uh, the fact that I can tell you everything we know from a scientific perspective about well-being, and unless you actually practice it and apply it in your life, it won't be that helpful to you. So we can, we can know that eating our vegetables is important, but unless we actually eat our vegetables, we don't experience the health benefits. So we're going to talk a bit about engagement, enactment, and embodiment of well-being and wellness as we talk together. So although we all want to be happy, it turns out that we're pretty confused about what it is that, that makes us happy. We think that there's a certain state in the future, a certain destination we're going to arrive in, and then we'll be able to practice well-being, then we'll be able to be happy, then we'll be able to flourish. Um, but really, this placing our happiness in some future outcome, in some uh, in, in anything really that's outside of ourself that isn't under our control um, leads to a lot of psychological suffering. So I wanna also kind of introduce this conversation with the recognition that although we all wanna be happy, some of the time, and sometimes it's not conscious, we place our happiness in things that uh, don't ultimately lead to a sense of happiness and well-being, and that can actually create some more suffering for us. So if we're confused about happiness and we all want to be happy, um, why is this particularly important for lawyers? Why am I invited here to talk to, to this group today? And as I'm sure most of you know, um, I want to just highlight why it is that it seems like particularly within the legal profession, this seems to be an important conversation to be having. Uh, there's a lot of uh, emerging research on this and it's been done for, um, over 20 years, and, and the rates of incidence of mental health issues seem to only be going in the direction that we don't want them to go. It seems to be increasingly a problem that people are struggling with depression, anxiety, substance abuse issues. And I'm gonna include um, a little bit of the, the research that's been done that looks at uh, the experiences of lawyers and what they're reporting about their experiences um, with, you know, around uh, 13,000 lawyers interviewed for this particular study, 28% of them suffering from depression. This is higher than national averages in other occupations. 19% 19, uh, 19 suffering with anxiety. This is about 7% higher than what we see in, uh, in uh, normal population. So non-lawyer population, we see these rates a lot lower. Um, and also problematic drinking and substance abuse specifically. So if, throughout the scientific literature, you know, we really know that it seems that, it seems that substance abuse in particular uh, is a problem among, among lawyers. So these aren't, these aren't unique problems to the human condition, but it seems that there's something about the legal profession, there's something about the culture of the legal profession, the work that you do, that seems to make these rates higher. And in addition to that, that there's barriers to intervention. There's barriers to getting the help that's needed given these concerns or conditions. And we know that over time, left untreated, these conditions often worsen. And uh, there's major consequences, not only to 
the person who's experiencing these mental health issues to their clients, to their families, and a ripple effect from that. So we know that the risk is highest for attorneys in the early years of practice. I suspect that this is part of why uh, the Young Lawyers Association is interested in this work as well. Um, and we know that there's major barriers to seeking help that have to do with concern about stigma of, seepi- of seeking help for psychological challenges. Um, and only about 7% of people who are struggling with these issues uh, within the legal profession end up seeking treatment. 22% of them use lawyer assistance programs, so it's excellent to know that those resources are available um, and want to encourage the use of these resources, but also start to think about what are ways we can address this, each of us kind of individually in our lives, um, and start to kind of shift the bar towards being able to talk about mental health, being able to talk about well-being and wellness, such that we can see Uh, a change in the barriers to seeking help over time. Um, And most of this is drawn from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, um, but really throughout throughout the field of mental health, the legal profession and rates within the legal profession are really becoming something we're aware of. Now enter in the Center for Healthy Minds. I want to introduce you to Dr. Richard Davidson, um, who is my supervisor at the Center for Healthy Minds and has really pioneered a field of research that's looking at not just studying uh, depression and anxiety, but also studying the cultivation of Uh, well-being from the perspective of of kindness, of compassion, of awareness and mindfulness, which are some of the things we're going to explore together today. So rather than me describe to you some of the work we do at the center, I'm going to have Dr. Richard Davidson tell you a little bit about this work and frame the conversation for us. I'm Richard Davidson, and I'm the founder of the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I first met His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 1992. That was a pivotal meeting for me, largely because he challenged me. He said to me, you've been using tools of modern neuroscience to investigate anxiety and fear and depression. Why can't you use those same tools to study kindness and compassion, to study the positive qualities of life? And I didn't have a very good answer for him. And it was a wake-up call for me to begin to orient our work toward a focus on well-being and healthy qualities of mind that eventually culminated in the founding of the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds. One of the aspirations is to enable this work to really live on to produce the kind of change we so importantly need. What's at stake is nothing short than the flourishing of humanity and the planet. It is absolutely critical that we get along more cooperatively and more compassionately. I feel like I am totally and thoroughly dedicated to doing this work for the remainder of my time. I just feel that very deeply in my bones. This is why I'm here. So this work that we're doing at the center, oh, oh, it looks like we already have a question uh, from folks online. From a web viewer, yeah, we do, Abby. Um, you mentioned three categories. Uh, a web viewer asks, do the people in those three categories, uh, over in these three categories, overlap? Um, so I believe the question was probably related to the hedonic, eudaimonic, and kind of enactment. Absolutely, so we all pursue well-being in those different ways. Um, for some of us, hedonic well-being is really what we're pursuing most of the time, but there might be ways in which we engage in pursuing well-being using other strategies too. So they absolutely overlap. And what I'd like to suggest is shifting our perspective more towards the pursuit of eudaimonic well-being, research suggests, is leading to more life satisfaction action overall. So although we think the immediate gratification, the immediate satisfaction is what will lead us to happiness, turns out in the long term, that's not the case. So yeah, absolutely. And thanks. Please feel free to uh, throw in questions whenever you'd like to. 
Um, so really the main premise of what we're going to be exploring together this morning comes from this very simple notion um, that well-being is a skill. It's not fixed. We, aren't, we don't have a set point of well-being that we can't shift or alter based on how we engage with our life and our circumstances. And so what we're going to talk about today and what we're going to practice today is some of the skills of well-being that our research is showing to really be effective. Um, so when we talk about well-being as a skill, one thing that, that often people need to also understand to really accept that this is something that we can change, that we can alter, is that our, our brains, our minds, are constantly changing and evolving based on our experience. So our brain is highly adaptable. We used to think not that long ago in the field of modern psychology that at a certain age things were fixed and you weren't going to see any change afterwards, and that's not the case. So the brain is constantly adapting, and we can influence those adaptations, those changes that happen by creating new habits, new patterns that lay down new neural networks, and this is neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity itself is neutral. Whatever we're doing, whatever habits we're doing, we're laying down patterns in the brain. But what we can harness, what we can really do here in a way that is really incredibly, uh, incredibly pointing to the potential of our minds that we don't often recognize and we don't often utilize, is we can start to shape and shift our patterns and habits of behaving and orient towards well-being, orient to towards what science is telling us is really conducive to living a life that we will look back on and feel good about and be happy about, experience less mental health issues, experience less uh, substance abuse issues through the practice of well-being as an ongoing practice in one's life. Yeah, so our question. web viewer clarifies the question. Um, he's asking, are the depressed alcoholics in the third category the same, 20% of lawyers? Are, well, oh, I'm sorry. So it sounds like their question was actually about the percentages, the prevalence rates. Sounds like it, yeah. Yeah, so are the, so the categories of depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, there's a lot of comorbidity there. So there's a lot of overlap between uh, those experiences as well. Depression usually tends to point to rumination, so uh, having difficulty being stuck in the past, wishing things were different than they were in a way that's often kind of past-oriented, whereas with anxiety, that's typically more oriented towards the future, wondering what if, what's going to happen uh, in the future, predicting what's going to happen. And both those capacities of our mind are useful. It's really useful to be able to look at the past and learn from our mistakes. But when we get stuck in those ruminative patterns, that's when it leads to depression. And similarly, with anxiety, really helpful to plan for the future. None of us would be here. None of us would, be, would have been able to uh, pursue our academic and career choices if we didn't have that ability to plan for the future. But what happens with anxiety is that becomes something where we're planning for the future and predicting negative outcomes, worrying about things that we have no ability to control or influence, and we get stuck in patterns of anxiety. So there is a third option between focusing on the past and focusing on the future, and that has to do with the present moment, which is what we'll be exploring a little bit going forward. So a good question, and one to, to certainly say that these, these categories are, are not distinct. There's a lot of overlap. Uh, so again, kind of coming back to this notion of harnessing neuroplasticity. So our brains can change and adapt. How do we direct them or orient them towards well-being? So at the center, we have a model of well-being that's comprised of four constituent parts. We're going to talk about each of those. So the first one is awareness. And this is the most fundamental. Who here in this room, I know I won't be able to see a, a show of hands from folks online, but who here in this room has heard of mindfulness? So just show of hands. OK, so really almost everybody in the room. And five years ago, 10 years ago, when I would ask that question, I would certainly not get everybody in the room. So that's, that's good news in terms of this basic skill of awareness. Uh, the basic premise is that we can orient our attention in a particular way 
So towards the present moment and non-judgmentally. So when people talk about mindfulness, that's a very classic definition by John Kabat-Zinn, which, which really just points to, it's about orienting attention in the present moment without judgment. And we are gonna practice that, but just to kind of give you that definition of, of what mindfulness is. And why is awareness important? So at any given time, uh, there was a study done at, at Harvard that highlights this. At any given time, we are often not focused on the task at hand. You have something in front of you um, with lawyers for billing. This is often something that's very relevant. And you have something in front of you, but you're not focusing or paying attention to it. Your mind wanders to something else. And this is something that our minds do. But when our minds create habits of this mind wandering, habits of not paying attention to what is right in front of us, it causes a lot of psychological suffering. So the study done at Harvard that really highlights this is they used smartphones and they pinged people you know, throughout their day as they were going about their lives, and they asked them just a couple simple questions. You know, what are you doing right now? And were you focusing on what you were doing? Were you paying attention to what you were doing? Uh, and um, who, so I, I love asking this question because there's such a range. So um, of the time that folks were, were pinged for this particular study, how much of the time do you think people were focused on the task in front of them? Uh, do you think it was about a quarter of the time they were focused on the task in front of them? I, I see a couple nods there. Okay, maybe about a fifth of the room. Um, what about half the time? Who thinks half the time they were focused on? Yeah, okay, so, so seeing more folks uh, raise their hands there. What about 75% of the time? All right, so you're, you're accurate. About 47% of the time when folks responded, they were not paying attention to what was right in front of them. 47% of the time, they were mind wandering. And that mind wandering was correlated with, uh, with lower mood. So when we're not focusing and paying attention on what's right in front of us, it seems to have a negative consequence for our mood. It also seems to be a pretty ubiquitous problem where 47% of the time, if we're having a conversation with a loved one, our attention isn't there. 47% of the time, we might be meeting with a client, have important deadlines, important things that we're attending to, and we're, we're not fully present and engaged in that interaction. So that's pretty alarming, and many people suggest this is really a societal issue where we have an attention deficit culture, um, but I want to push us to think about that's actually something that's very trainable. And the research on mindfulness-based interventions in particular starts to show us some of the effects and benefits of practice. Now, most of these results were with a intervention that was eight weeks, so a mindfulness-based intervention. So um, one day of practice won't necessarily result in these types of results. Um, but these are, are pretty staggering, pretty powerful results over a wide range of mental health indicators, physical health indicators, uh, life satisfaction, well-being indicators that mindfulness-based interventions in particular seem to be helpful. There's also a lot of incorporation of mindfulness in different settings. So um, I, I did find the mindful lawyer, uh, but in the field of medicine, in the field of clinical clinical psychology, education, business, uh, our work at the Center for Healthy Minds intersects with a lot of these different areas, and we're seeing pretty important, meaningful change uh, throughout different industries as these practices get applied. Um, so what does this mean particularly for the legal profession? I wanna highlight the work of one um, pioneer in this field, uh, Rhonda McGee, and she's based at the University of San Francisco Law School. She was recently here speaking at the law school at UW. Um, we hope that she'll be back again. And she's been a pioneer in this work. So in bringing together contemplative practice, mindfulness practice in particular, but contemplative practice broadly into the legal profession and into both the training um, of lawyers, but also the, the ongoing development. And she really identified amongst uh, her students 
who were in law school that they were struggling with mental health issues and concerns and wanted to be able to bring within their education a way to address uh, some of their ongoing mental health concerns and some of the systemic barriers within the legal profession as well. So um, someone to check out if this is something that you're interested in and has, has published in this area as well. So uh, we have some good indicators that awareness is a good place for us to start this conversation about well-being. So let's go ahead and practice awareness together. So with each of these four constituent parts, we're gonna engage in a practice. And this first one with awareness, I'm gonna suggest that um, if this is something you've, you've never done before, so again, I won't be able to pull our online folks, but for those in the room, who has done mindfulness practice before? Okay, so everybody in the room pretty much had heard of it, but closer to half have practiced it. So we're gonna practice it together. It's pretty simple. Uh, I'm gonna invite, if you'd like to, you can close your eyes, but otherwise you're welcome to leave them open. I usually suggest that people lower their gaze, because otherwise it can feel a little weird if you're staring at people while doing the practice. But really, what's ever comfortable for you. You're invited to have an upright posture, but you can also just sit comfortably as long as you feel supported by the chair or the seat beneath you. And as we begin this practice, the first invitation is just to notice your experience in this moment. So notice whatever physical sensations are present in your body. And this might be just feeling where your body makes contact with the chair beneath you. It might be feeling the sensation of the air on your skin. So just taking a moment to be aware of your physical body and in this moment of any sensations in your physical body. Then we can bring awareness to our thoughts. We can notice what thoughts are passing through our minds. Perhaps our minds are very busy and there's a lot of thoughts moving through quickly. Perhaps our minds feel more calm and there's just a passing thought here or there. So here we're just bringing awareness to thinking and noticing this regular experience that usually flies under the radar of our awareness. So just aware of our thoughts. And next, aware of our emotions, aware of any feelings that are present. So here, it may be feeling tired. It may be feeling awake and excited, feeling happy, feeling stressed. We're just taking a moment to check in, see what our internal weather is like. What do we notice about how we're feeling this morning? And then with this check-in, we can gather our attention and we can focus on the sensations of breathing. So here, we're not thinking about the breath. We're simply bringing awareness in this moment to the direct sensations of breathing in and breathing out. So it may be in the rise and fall of your chest that the breath feels apparent, or it may be in the air coming in and out of your nostrils or your mouth. So gently resting awareness on the sensations of breathing. And we don't need to change or alter the pace of our breathing. We're just shining the light of attention and awareness on the breath. It's natural for our minds to wander. And when we notice that our mind has gotten caught up in thoughts or stories, we just gently bring our attention back to the sensations of breathing seeing if we can be with one full breath, the inhalation, the pause, 
and the exhalation. And now letting go of the focus on the breath, I'm inviting you once more to take a look at your experience right now. Whatever sensations, whatever thoughts, whatever feelings are present as we expand out and just notice right here, right now, what's it like in this moment? And now if your eyes have been closed, I wanna invite you to open them <coughs> and to return your attention back to the front of the room. So is anyone willing to share what they noticed? That was just a, a three minute awareness practice. Anyone willing to share what they noticed? And folks online are welcome to chime in as well. Yeah. I, I, did, have to, I did have to chase my thoughts. Yeah. It was like lassoing them back again. Mm -hmm. So uh, that itself is the practice. One of the major misconceptions about mindfulness and meditation is that we're trying to clear our minds. We're trying to get rid of our thoughts. It is natural for the mind to, to think, to judge, to perceive. And as we notice that's what's happening, uh, we simply kind of reorient, we give our minds a new task to focus on the breath. And if we do that, you know, a hundred times, we are training the mind that we can actually have a say in where our attention and focus goes. So thank you for sharing that, and that's absolutely the practice. Uh, so our minds wander, depending on what's going on, uh, to different things, and we just bring it back to whatever we've chosen to be the object of our awareness, and in this case, it was the breath. So anyone else want to share what you noticed in that practice? So common experiences, often, uh, sometimes people experience a sense of increased calm that by bringing awareness to their experience to the breath, when they return to noticing the thoughts and feelings and sensations they have, there's a sense of increased calmness. For some folks, when they do this practice, they notice how busy their minds are. They notice that there's thoughts going all the time, and it's really hard to come back to the breath. It's really hard to come back to that object. So that full range is really, all of it's okay, and all of it is the practice itself. I saw a hand, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it might have been about three and a half, but yeah, just, just around that, that much time. So slowing down just for three minutes, often what we find is when we come back to our work, we come back to the task at hand, um, we're a lot more able to engage with it. We feel like we've gotten a long break when it's only been a couple minutes. So it's also about how to use the breaks that we have effectively with, with practice. So um, I'm going to move on to connection. We could talk about awareness all morning, but want to make sure I touch on these other important constituent parts. Now with con connection, we know that relationship is important. We know that social support impacts our physical health, our recovery from disease. We know that uh, relationship satisfaction is one of the things at the end of life that people comment on as most significantly contributing to their overall sense of, of well-being and life satisfaction. So how do we actually cultivate connection? So for this next practice with connection, um, it's going to be a little bit similar. It'll also only be just about three minutes. And with the practice of connection, what I'm going to invite you to do, if you'd like to, you can close your eyes again. Otherwise, just lowering your gaze. And with this practice, we're going to use our imagination. So I'm going to invite you to uh, imagine uh, someone in your life that you feel a sense of connection with, that you feel a sense of warmth, of kindness, as you bring them to mind. So this might be a friend or a family member. It might be a coworker. It could be, if no one immediately comes to mind, it might be a pet. It might be someone you don't know very well that you've seen on television, just someone for whom the very thought of them or bringing that image to mind of this person gives you a sense of, of kindness, of warmth. And as you imagine this person, 
you can imagine that they're offering their wish for happiness, their wish for your well-being. And see what it feels like to just imagine this person in front of you offering a sense of well-being. And see if you can reciprocally offer your wish for happiness to this person. So using our imagination to imagine a person we're connected with and them extending all of their good wishes to you. And if it feels right to you, you extending your good wishes to this person. And if it's comfortable, you're welcome to expand this wish for happiness and well-being to others, maybe to others in this room, to those joining us online, to those we work with, just in our mind, in our heart and mind, offering a wish for their happiness and well-being. And then just notice how we feel after we've extended this wish, after we've received a sense of connection through imagining. And now if your eyes have been closed, an invitation to open them, to return your attention back to the front of the room or to your computer. And curious here if anyone's willing to share what they notice. Was it easy to come up with someone in your life that you feel that sense of connection with? Okay. Um, I see a lot of nods for, for folks online. There's a lot of nods in the audience here. Now, it's not always easy. Some people who have conflict in a lot of their relationships, it can be hard, and that's why the invitation is um, you know, to use a pet, to use someone you know, perhaps famous that you really respect and admire. But these brief practices of just imagining the support of another person and uh, imagining you extending your support to another person, we, we have found are beneficial not only for kind of positive emotions, positive mood, but also a sense of resources. When we have a sense of inner resources, this is, comes out of the work of social baseline theory, um, what we find is just our perception of feeling connected and being connected to others increases our sense of capacity to approach difficulties and challenges that we encounter. So we, we absolutely want to work on the relationships in our lives and improving those relationships because they're important to us, but we also can use as a well-being practice a way to cultivate and increase our awareness of those connections that do exist in our life and our aspiration to, uh, for both ourselves and others for happiness and well-being. So uh, I'm going to keep moving on to make sure that we touch on insight which is our third constituent of well-being. And with this one, I'm not gonna do a guided practice, but we're gonna think about this one a little bit more. And um, I come from a family of, of lawyers. My, my father's an attorney, my sister, my brother-in-law are attorneys, studied here at UW. So I know that the thinking and judging mind is one that lawyers really excel in. And it is a very important function of the mind to be able to do that. But what happens is when we aren't applying or orienting or directing that in ways that are useful and helpful, we start to judge and pick apart ourselves, our experience, others in ways that, that aren't actually helpful or useful. We become very judgmental and very critical of ourselves and the things around us. So what the, the well-being skill of insight helps us with is understanding how are we identifying ourselves with our experience? How are we um, taking particular aspects of our experience or of other people and creating narratives and stories of those experiences that lead us to psychological suffering. So with this, uh, what, what I'd ask you to consider is to look at the role of how we identify ourselves with these component parts of our experience that are on the left of the screen, with the thoughts, the feelings, the behaviors, and the physical sensations that we experience. So when we're experiencing pain, often we identify with that pain. When we have negative thoughts, often we're identifying with those negative thoughts. And on the right of the screen, 
Uh, this is from the work of, of Broth and Brenner on understanding the biopsychosocial context of our experience. But the reason it's included here is we can also start to examine in an analytical way, so using that judging faculty of the mind, to look at uh, how our experience, say, of anxiety is actually related to just the physiology of our body. So we can look at the biological level. When we notice we're feeling anxious, we can look at the physical sensations that go along with anxiety. We can look at the factors from a psychological perspective contributing to our anxiety. Perhaps we've had previous things happen in our past that increases our sense of anxiety. We can look at the social context. Anxiety happens a lot in, in social settings, in the face of other people. And we can look at cultural conditions and systems that impact our experience of this. So the point of the insight uh, skill and the insight constituent of well-being is that the more we know about the way our minds work, the more self-awareness we have about these patterns and habits of mind, and the more we can start to uh, deconstruct and see these component parts of our experience, the less we identify and fuse who we are and how we are with the things we're struggling with or challenged by. So this insight uh, can be a, a way to really look at experience, examine it, and feel more free of the patterns and the conditions that we've lived with. So I see a question there, yeah. yeah I have a question about anxiety. Mm -hmm. In my experience, anxiety is contagious. And, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that most of the time, lawyers are dealing with people who are anxious because they wouldn't have come to the lawyer but for their anxiety about fill in the blank. Absolutely. So, doesn't that correlate with higher levels of anxiety if you catch it from your clients? Absolutely, yeah, so a very good point. We don't, we don't yet understand all of the mechanisms by which anxiety is contagious, but we do absolutely know that we have an effect on others' mental and physiological states. So if we're constantly meeting with clients that are anxious, we may notice just the physiological arousal of anxiety that comes up in the face of that that might not be about a story that's happening in our own, in our own minds, but is really about the experience of the person sitting in front of us. So absolutely, understanding that relationally those around us can have an impact on our mental health and well-being um, is an important part of insight, absolutely. And yeah. then your tolerance keeps rising as well, right? So y you may not even notice anymore that that's anxiety. That just feels normal. Right, right. So uh, our baseline can become one that is anxious. I've, I've also heard this as it relates to the legal profession, um, kind of being aggressive and approaching things in a very sharp, aggressive way is advantageous in, in many situations. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't do this by practice. I have witnessed this before, though. And so that's actually you know, reinforced in one's profession. And we know that there's deleterious negative consequences of that when it's enduring for long periods of time. Um, so again, where these practices done short times, many times, can interrupt some of the chronic accumulation of anxiety in that case, or accumulation of the effects of, of anger. Yeah, so a lot more to say here, but just the tool, the skill I want to point to is being able to examine kind of objectively our experience and see some of the constituent parts and not identify with them as, as who we are. So the last and uh, certainly not to be left out constituent of well-being is purpose. So for purpose, we know that having a sense of purpose in one's life is an important predictor even for longevity. So people tend to live longer when they have a, a, a sense of their, their purpose and meaning in life. So this harkens back to the eudaimonic well-being that we were speaking about earlier. So I want to say just a few things about purpose as we uh, bring our time together to a close. And the first one is that it's, it's partially about living a life where you're doing the things that are meaningful to you, so living a life in alignment with your values. But it's also about being able to infuse purpose into the things that we're already in doing in our lives. So recognizing some of the things that we do on a daily basis that are actually an expression of caring for our clients, caring for our family. We may do the dishes in a way that we're uh, 
frustrated, angry, ruminating about the day, or we may do the dishes in a way that recognizes, oh, although I'm just doing the dishes, doing the dishes is an expression of my care for my family, my care for myself, and we can actually infuse that daily activity with a sense of purpose. So it's not just about adding things to your life that give you a sense of purpose, but infusing the things that you're already doing with that greater sense of meaning and purpose. So with trying this one, this is really just asking you to contemplate what really matters to you. You showed up here this morning, you logged on online, you showed up in this room this morning because something matters to you about well-being and wellness and you want to cultivate that. So how might practicing well-being help you live a life of more purpose, a life that's more in alignment with your values? And I want to uh, highlight a few strategies informed by science before we continue, but really inviting you to consider that contemplating purpose and living your life in alignment with your values, infusing the things you already do with a sense of purpose, is, is conducive to well-being in ways that uh, we're only just kind of scratching the surface of. So, if we know what's important to us, we know well-being is important to us, what gets in the way of actually practicing? And this is the last um, you know, really important message that I want to give, which is we can use strategies to bring these practices into our life short times, many times throughout the day. I mean, it could be practicing three minutes, five minutes. A lot of times people don't do meditation or practice well-being skills because they think they need a half an hour every day. And we don't have a half an hour to, to set aside. So starting small with just a few minutes every day is what I'm going to suggest, and applying strategies informed by science. So. I'm going to touch on a few of these and then just invite if there's questions, I can come back to them so I can make sure uh, that we end in time. So with the science of behavior change, what we know is that it's very important to know your motivation, so this reflection on purpose is important. We also know that if you translate your intention into action by writing it down, by using an if-then plan, you're a lot more successful in actually creating these new habits of well-being in your life. You can use these new habits of well-being to disrupt existing habits. Like for instance, uh, if a habit happens to be opening up a bottle of, of wine or a can of beer every day at the end of the workday, um, using that as a cue to remind you to practice awareness, practice connection, practice insight. So actually using cues of unhealthy habits to remind us to practice healthy habits. We can transform the, the patterns of suffering into actually what reminds us to practice well-being. We can also develop new routines that create new habits. Uh, we can use this really important concept of piggybacking, which is where if there's something we're already doing every day, we apply the well-being skill to that thing that we're doing every day. So for instance, uh, one of my favorites is, is showering. Um, how often do you get in the shower? You get in, you get out, and you don't even realize you've been wet. Your mind is paying attention to what you have to do that day, your to-do list, and you don't notice the sensations of the water on your skin, the smell of the soap. So something you're doing every day, like showering, like brushing your teeth, like eating, you can use these already established habits and piggyback your new well-being habits on top of these existing habits. Uh, additionally, social support. So we know so much that having someone that you're talking to about the new behavior, the new skills you're developing, will increase the likelihood of you actually making the change in your life. So social support is very important. And last, visualization. So we experimented with this a little bit today, but the, this practice of being able to imagine yourself going about your life, practicing well-being, relating to your clients in effective ways, that skill of visualization used intentionally can really help change behavior as well. So this isn't the same as ruminating, daydreaming, paying attention to other things, but intentionally visualizing what it is that you're wanting to, to change or alter in one's experience. 
So before we wrap up, and I will be here for, to answer more questions, but before we wrap up, let's actually apply this purpose and apply what we've learned so far today. And remember that you can train your mind to be healthy, but it does require training. It does require practice. And I'm gonna ask each of you to identify one practice and one reminder. So the reminder are these behavior change strategies that I mentioned. So one way that you're gonna kind of reinforce this practice in your life and write it down. We know actually writing it down, writing down and making that commitment to yourself will increase the likelihood of you following through. So perhaps it's awareness. Each time I sit down at my desk in the morning, I'm going to bring awareness to my experience. I'm gonna notice what I'm thinking and feeling as I arrive at work today. And in order to reinforce that, I'm going to tell a coworker, I'm going to uh, put a message on my schedule, on my calendar, to remind me to do my awareness practice, my well-being practice. So whatever it is for you that you've connected with, making a note, writing it down. And uh, there's a lot of resources available online for different practices as well, so I want to invite you to explore those. Um, but overall, you know, I've, I really appreciate the efforts that have brought me in this room to speak with you all. Um, I've hopefully given you a few ideas for how to cultivate well-being in your lives. And uh, what I'd also like you to take away with our time together is that our minds are pliable, our experience is workable, and there's a lot we can do to shift and orient our awareness and our attention towards the things that are conducive to health and happiness and well-being. We're not stuck where we are. So may you recognize the potential of your mind, and may you use these skills and practices so that they benefit you, and also so that they benefit your clients, your family, your friends. And uh, just very happy to, to be here to speak with you all, and would love to hear if there's any questions or, or comments. Here are a few additional opportunities to learn if you're interested. Yeah. You know, oh, I, the I question is uh, just for the web viewers, oh, yeah. a, a book or something that you have to recommend. Yeah, um, I have a, a number of books that I'd recommend. Um, John Cabot Zinn is an author that uh, developed he developed uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and his work would be kind of the first thing that I would recommend. There's a lot of good workbooks as well, but John Cabot Zinn uh, has a couple books that I think would be a, a good starting point. I, I realize that um, I'll maybe follow up with, with Tom and with Mary after this. I don't know if there's been kind of the tome of mindful lawyering that has been written yet. If it, if it hasn't been written, Rhonda McGee is on her way to writing it, um, but that's something I'll follow up with you about. Yeah. Um, just because the notice of a book was brought up, mm -hmm. um, I'm just finishing uh, Why Buddhism is True by Robert oh, yeah. Wright. Uh, the title is, you know, a, a catchy marketing thing, but I think it's basically a, a mindfulness uh, primer. Uh, but, but the question I have, it can't be answered in half a second, but um, you know, the mind is pliable is, is your premise, and you know, I agree with it you know, and all that. The, the toughest situation I've encountered with family, with friends, with clients is is PTSD yeah because the mind has already just been just shaped so dramatically that any attempts to shape it in a different way gets right back to where it's been shaped it, anything any the, the main thing yeah so great question the main thing with PTSD and with trauma is a recommendation that um, that there is treatment that's pursued for that but in terms of these practices and skills they absolutely can benefit people struggling with with PTSD and they can benefit those that are working with those that are struggling with PTSD the breath for someone who's experienced trauma is not always 
the most stable of objects for them to focus on. So when people have PTSD, often there can be um, panic where breathing is not a stable object. So for, for people who struggle with panic in that way, often using an object like paying attention to the color in the room can be an awareness object that can downregulate uh, their arousal and activate the parasympathetic nervous system and help them calm down. So these practices absolutely work with PTSD, but with PTSD I, I would definitely recommend also getting treatment in, in terms of therapy as well. Yeah, great question. And feel free to follow up with me afterwards as well. Yeah. Any other question or comments before we wrap up? So I also will just put here this final slide. If you'd like to be in touch with us with follow-up questions, you know my email is on the bottom there, but also um, I hope you'll consider the Center for Healthy Minds a resource in this work. I think that there's quite a lot of, of mutual interest here in cultivating well-being and cultivating well-being for those that are doing really important work in this world across sectors, including the important work that you're all doing in the legal profession. So thank you for your work and thank you for your interest in cultivating well-being. Thanks, Abby. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lindemann. Uh, all right, 10 o'clock, we'll take a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll start up at 10 after.
All right, we're back. Uh, hour number two. Uh, hope those of you on the web are, uh, are back with us. Uh, once again on the web, you have an opportunity to submit questions uh, with a link on your screen for those of you here in the room. Uh, just raise your hand. Uh, give me a minute to get to you with the microphone so that the people on the web uh, can hear the question. Uh, so we're gonna shift gears a little bit now. Uh, the second hour, um, we're gonna talk about um, uh, sort of the, uh, the, the legal aspects of this, uh, labor law and how, uh, how that applies to employees and employers uh, when we're dealing with uh, the workplace and, and situations like that. Um, so with us uh, on your panel discussion here, uh, in the middle is Lindsay Davis. Lindsay is an associate in the Labor and Employment Practice Group of Quarles and Brady. Uh, she is committed to practical front-end solutions to employer needs and comprehensive advocacy of client interests. Uh, Lindsay regularly represents clients in state and federal court as well as before various administrative agencies including the Equal Rights Division, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, Department of Labor, uh, National Labor Relations Board, and Workers' Compensation Division. Uh, her practice covers a broad range of issues involving counseling, discipline, and discharge of employees as well as state and federal employment discrimination law. Lindsay has extensive experience in the areas of disability law and family medical leave. To my immediate right is Kerry Mohan. He is a member of the Labor and Employment Group of Quarles and Brady as well. Kerry's practice focuses on counseling employers on compliance on a wide variety of federal and state employment and labor issues regarding occupational safety and health, corporate transactions, employee discipline, terminations, and reductions in force, performance counseling, and employment litigation. Uh, Kerry also advises companies and boards of directors on the full spectrum of labor and employment issues. And of course, on my far right is Aviva Meridian Kaiser. Aviva, of course, is ethics counsel here at the State Bar of Wisconsin. Prior to joining the State Bar in 2013, Aviva taught at the UW Law School for 25 years. She taught professional responsibilities, ethical and professional considerations in writing, problem solving, and risk management. And with that, I will throw it over to the panel. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, navigating leave and disability laws and the ethical challenges that may bring with employees uh, who have mental uh, issues, health concerns, or addiction concerns as well. Uh, the, the purpose of this is to have an open dialogue. So if anybody has any questions throughout the presentation, just please feel free to ask. Um, and what we hope to do is uh, provide some basic tools and framework for employers, managers, partners, and how to deal with these issues. The uh, disability-related issues are perhaps the most nuanced of any employment law issue that we deal with on a regular basis because they are so fact-intensive. There's no bright line rule. It's case-by-case -case basis. And so we want to be able to provide you at least the ability to identify issues and uh, get ahead of them as opposed to making a rash, instinctive decision whenever a problem does arise. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll start off with some nuts and bolts from the beginning and then we'll go through some real life examples of what we've seen in our practice and counseling our clients as well. Uh, and, uh, and so Lindsay and I, we're going to be discussing more on the employment issues, but Aviva has graciously agreed to join us to provide some ethical insight as well. So to start off, we just want to provide a primer on the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. And uh, who does this apply to? Generally speaking, the rule of thumb is uh, employers with 15 or more employees uh, over a calendar year, 20 weeks of a calendar year. So if you're, if you're below that threshold, the ADA does not apply to you. Um, if it does, it certainly, if you have more than that, it certainly does apply. Now where it gets nuanced in the, the practice of law is the issue of who is an employee. Uh, it is by definition an individual employed by an employer. So for associates, a Steph really helpful definition, right? This is so circular. <laughs> yeah. So, so for uh, associates, staff attorneys, secretaries, assistants, paralegals, almost always that's going to satisfy the definition. But for partners, that's a much more nuanced, distinct issue, uh, and there has been litigation over it. And uh, and that uh, and there's generally been found to be a six-factor test that that looks into whether a partner truly is a partner or if they a statutory employee. So what you're looking for is whether the, the firm can hire and fire the, the employee, you know, discipline, set rules, set responsibilities for that, that partner. 
um, whether the firm actively supervises that partner. You know, you know, specifically says you need to do this, you need to do that, you can't do this. Uh, those are all factors there. Uh, whether the partner reports to an individual hire. Um, it, of course, there's the managing partner, there's the board, the comp committee, all, all exec committees, all different committees on any number of uh, firms. But uh, you know, to what extent is there a chain of command and a duty to report and up and down? Whether that partner has the ability to influence the firm, you know, make recommendations that will be effective uh, and received. Uh, do the parties intend it to be an employment or independent contractor relationship? So generally speaking, all partner contracts do have an independent contractor uh, title to them. It's clear in the agreement, generally. Uh, but just because the contract says that doesn't necessarily mean in the face of the law that's the controlling factor. And then whether the uh, partner is subject to share the lost profits, expenses, exposures, benefits of the firm. So if, uh, if the partner has the ability to, to win whenever the firm's doing well, and also lose whenever the firm is you know, in a tough time, that's one factor there. Now this is, uh, has been a hotly contested area uh, because I think in any given circumstance, you may have partners in your firm that clearly appear to be true par partners, excuse me, and you have other ones that may be employees. And with the bifurcated uh, income partner, equity or capital partners, you know, function and format of many firms now makes it even more nuanced and, and a trickier issue. So what is a disability? Uh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, it's a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities or a record of such impairment or being regarded as having such impairment. So what does that mean? Uh, under the, before, uh, about a decade ago, there was the, the definition of a disability was not quite as broad. And employers were able to make successful arguments that an individual was not disabled because the condition was temporary, the, condi the condition was in remission, what have you. But under the Americans with Dis Disabilities uh, Act, Amendment Act, uh, it made the definition of disability much broader. And so typically in our practice now, it's very difficult to argue that someone is not disabled under the law. There's some instances you can, but for instance, temporary conditions can be considered disabilities under the act now. Um, and so whenever someone, an employee, does come to you and say, I have this condition, what we used to, what, what employers used to be able to say, well, that's not covered under the act, now you have to take a much more fruitful, thoughtful approach to ensure, okay, is this really a disability? Is it protected? Because if so, certain obligations arise. And what are those obligations? Um, of course, employers are prohibited from discriminating against an employee based on disability or perceived as being disabled. Now, perceived as being disabled is an interesting aspect in that the person may not actually have a true disability, but we view them as having that. And in particular, mental illness or addiction is one of those areas where perception may carry the day. And that the person previously had to go to rehab or uh, counseling for anxiety issues, depression, what have you, but that stigma attaches. And as a result, if, we're, if that perception still attaches to that employee and we're taking actions because of that perception, that's just as unlawful as discriminating against someone who has heart disease, cancer. So it's something to be aware of. And then the duty to pro provide a reasonable accommodation is key under disability laws. And what does that mean? It means you engage in the interactive process with an employee. Uh, if an employee raises, say, I have this medical condition, I need an adjusted schedule, I need some help in this area, or if you learn through objective facts that this person may need an accommodation, we have a duty as the employer to engage in the interactive process, which means just a straightforward, honest conversation with the employee about what is your condition, what accommodations do you need, and whether those accommodations are reasonable or do they cause a, an undue burden on our, ourselves. Each one is fact intensive, each one is case by case basis, you can't make broad sweeps uh, and strokes about that, uh, and, and that is why this area is so complicated. Now, in addition to the Americans with Disabilities Act, we also have the Wisconsin Fair Employment Act, which has uh, very similar disability laws. The difference is 
There is no 15 employee rule. If you have an employee in Wisconsin, you're covered under the act. Um, and, but who is an employee? Again, it's, it does not include parents, spouse, child, or an independent contractor. So the partner issue that we discussed before is the same under Wisconsin law as it is under federal law as well. And then in addition to what is a disability, it's very similar to that under the federal law. And then also what is required of employers. Again, it's very similar. Same, same aspects apply regarding the ability to, uh, you can't discriminate, and that means you know, terms, conditions, <clears throat> benefits, uh, suspensions, uh, vacations, what have you. And then, but the, the, the ability to, the requirements to reasonably accommodate under Wisconsin law it has been interpreted to be broader in some circumstances than under federal law. So, uh, and that's what, so that is why it's important whenever you evaluate disabilities in the interactive process to engage in the full, fulsome, thoughtful uh, dialogue there. Yes, we have a question over here. So the question is, what's confusing as an employer is we cannot ask questions of the employee. The employee has to bring the concerns to us. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, that's what a lot of employers do. We're not prohibited from, if we have objective evidence and reasonable concerns about a situation, we're not prohibited from having an open dialogue with that employee about the concerns that we have. So for instance, if there's performance issues related to maybe uh, an addiction problem, we can raise those performance issues with the employee. Um, the, uh, the key is we have to keep all of that information strictly confidential. There's a, there's a duty to keep medical uh, information confidential under the ADA and state law. And that means putting that information in a distinct, separate personnel file and leaving and keeping that information to need to know people. And I would just add to that, I think Carrie's absolutely right. What I would add to that is if you're observing sudden shifts in an employee's behavior or performance in the work um, and you think there may be something else going on, what we're suggesting to you is the appropriate approach is bring the employee in and ask the question, what's going on? How are things going? Is there something we need to know about? We certainly cannot force an employee to provide us with information about their medical conditions or personal matters that are going on, but if they're refusing to provide that information, then an employer is well within their rights to take action based on performance issues or other problems that are appearing in the workplace and not be at risk for a disability claim. So I think you, as Carrie said, what the disability laws really enforce to employers is you should be engaging in a dialogue with your employees and doing your best to find out what's going on. And if an employee is not willing to participate in that process with you, um, then in some respects your hands are tied and you need to move forward with making decisions based on the information available to you. Yeah, but one thing we can't do is just stick our head in the sand. Right because there are increasing case law out there that where employers had objective good faith evidence regarding something may be up, but they never had that conversation. They never had that dialogue. So, uh, so I have a question because we know that under SCR 20 colon 5.1, which has partners or lawyers in managerial authority have to take protective measures, right? They have to make sure that there's policies and procedures in place to make sure everybody follows the rules. And the direct supervisor has to directly supervise to make sure that lawyer follows the rules. And then the worst part on 5.1c is that the lawyer can be vicariously liable for the other lawyer's ethical violation if that lawyer doesn't do anything or take remedial measures. But if we can't ask and say, you know, what's going on, tell me. Um, you can see our ethical requirements depart from the legal part. 
Yeah, and I think that's what we're saying is our our recommendation to the employers that we work with and we counsel is you do have the, the conversation. As Carrie said, you don't want to be sort of sticking your head in the sand and, um, you know, assuming that since they haven't come to me, there's nothing going on and I'm going to ignore mm -hmm. the facts of around me. So we do sort of advocate for engaging with the employees and it doesn't necessarily need to come from the direct supervisor for larger organizations or those with an HR department, we certainly advise that you have a trained human resources professional have that conversation with the employee. Again, that helps to protect the confidentiality and the sensitive nature of information that may come to light. Um, and also, I think it, it separates um, sort of the manager from having to have awareness or the employee, the discomfort of that information going broader than is strictly necessary. All good questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I am with the Wisconsin Lawyer Assistance Program, so I'm frequently in the position of having employees contact me and say I'm suffering with these issues. Mm -hmm. But as you know, the, the stigma and the shame and the fear of discrimination that go along with having some of these diagnoses makes them very, very reluctant to reach out to an employer to actually initiate that conversation. So I just think that's another argument for the employer to actually take the initiative for humanitarian reasons, for economic reasons, and for ethical reasons to have that, to have that conversation as well. So not so much a question, but a statement. And I think it's fair. It shows the importance of having a, a well-written policy in place so that you can show to employees that if you do come forward with us, this information is confidential. We will treat it with the utmost confidence. And we will not. Uh, and there is no retaliation. We have strong anti-retaliation policies as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I've been noticing with my children, they never get hired by a company anymore. They get hired by some sort of agency that employs them and then they w work for the company, but then the company, I, so th is this the s solution to the problem of these laws in that you totally remove yourself from having problems with employees if you always go through one of these agencies? It's such a good question, and it may have started that way, but the law has certainly caught up. And so what we know from all of the cases that we've seen is these obligations under the state and federal law apply both to that employment agency who is the actual employer of um, the individual, but also carry over to the company at which that person is placed. So the, the obligations apply whether you're the on paper employer or not. If you're um, becoming aware of issues like that that are impacting the individual's placement at your company, um, you have an obligations under the law. So we're going to move forward and, and just quickly and in the interest of time want to cover one other sort of major law that, that comes up often in these areas of mental health and addiction and that is the FMLA. Um, as you'll see there's again both a federal FMLA and then a, a Wisconsin state law equivalent and as previously there's a lot of overlap we'll talk about the couple distinctions that exist. Um, but the FMLA, the federal FMLA, is uh, a statute that applies to all employers who have 50 or more employees during 20 work weeks in a calendar year. Um, so you'll notice that employee threshold, the number of employee threshold is higher than what applied to the ADA and the state disability law. Um, there are also <clears throat> more stringent um, uh, requirements for who counts as an eligible employee under this statute. So you'll see on the slides and in the materials that you have to satisfy a number of requirements to be deemed eligible for the protections and rights available under the FMLA. Um, specifically, you have to have worked for the employer for at least 12 months. You have to have put in 1,250 working hours over the past 12 months. And you have to work in a location where there are at least 50 employees employed by the company within a 75 mile radius. Um, so a little stricter requirements than what applies for the ADA. 
Um, so let's assume you've got a covered employer and an eligible employee. What does that all mean? Um, well, basically it means that employees who suffer from a serious health condition or who need to care for an immediate family member suffering from such a condition are entitled to 12 work weeks of unpaid leave under the statute. That's protected leave. And so what that means is employers cannot um, discriminate or retaliate against qualifying employees who need to take that time off of work. Um, the definition of a serious health condition is a bit different than the definition of a disability. Um, and again, I think in some ways you can argue it's a harder standard to meet than under disability law. So you need to demonstrate that you've got an illness, injury, impairment, or a physical or mental condition that is involving inpatient care or continuing treatment by a healthcare provider. So if you've never seen a doctor for the particular health condition that you've identified as requiring you to take some time off of work, that's gonna be a problem under the FMLA. You're not gonna be entitled to the leave identified there. Um, as I mentioned, oh, am I pressing the wrong button? Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, there's a state law equivalent uh, for um, employees in the state of Wisconsin, and um, there's slightly different requirements. Again, employers are covered by the statute, or in other words, required to provide the, the leave identified, so long as they employ at least 50 individuals during the last six of 12 months. Um, who's an employee under the statute? Again, a little bit different. Um, so same that you have to still demonstrate that you've worked at least 52 consecutive weeks for the employer, but here only need to show that you've put in 1,000 work hours versus the 1250 that I mentioned under the federal law. And so what do you get if you've met all of those requirements? Um, here, again, the leave entitlement is a bit different. Under the state law, you're entitled to take two weeks of unpaid leave for your own serious health condition, and you get an additional two weeks of unpaid leave to care for an immediate family member suffering from a serious health condition. Your benefits are continued during that leave of absence and you're entitled to return to work in the same or equivalent position after you've taken that leave. Uh, the definition of a serious health condition is largely the same as under federal law. So now what we wanna do is get a little more interesting and talk with you about what we would characterize as some real life examples of the types of issues we see in this area and how the three of us would tackle those issues um, given our experience in, in handling these types of problems. Sure, so uh, please feel free to read along, but we have associate Andrea who works at a boutique law firm in Madison. For the past several years, the firm has consistently employed seven associate attorneys, three paralegals, and five support staff, as well as four partners, who are all partial owners of the firm. Lately, the firm's noticed some deficiencies in Andrea's work. She's uh, uncharacteristically missed some a client call, showed up late to a court appearance, and has been late and repeatedly reminded of internal deadlines. Uh, one day, uh, and a individual was walking by, one of the partners was walking by her office and noticed Andrea took a bottle of scotch from her drawer in her office and poured it into her coffee mug. The firm's policies prohibit drinking of alcohol during office working hours except for uh, limited exceptions for firm sponsored events. Uh, Pam approaches Andrea regarding the recent performance issues and her seeing Andrea drinking in the office. During the conversation, Andrea acknowledges she's been battling alcoholism and that her drinking is impacting both her work and home life. Uh, she's referenced the missing deadlines, client calls, as well as uh, notable withdrawal symptoms when she refrains from drinking. Uh, Andrea says she's been seen as psych a psychiatrist and has been diagnosed as an alcoholic, and her psychiatrist has recommended that she participate in a rehabilitation program, and Andrea, as a result, has requested time off to do so. Now, Lindsay, uh, what, based on this fact pattern, what do you see the firm's obligations under the laws related to this? Great, so I see here that Associate Andrea is asking for some time off of work. So in my mind, the first place that I'm always going to go to from an employment law standpoint is let's think about the FMLA, let's think about the Wisconsin FMLA. 
Here, though, um, based on the numbers that you provided, Carrie, I don't think that this boutique family law firm is one that is a covered employer under the FMLA statutes. That's because, as you've identified, it seems like they've got about 15 employees and then the four partners um, who are owners of the firm and who are running the show. So they don't meet that 50 employee threshold. And to me, what that, what that says is, although Andrea's condition of alcoholism um, may meet the definition of a serious health condition, and I think it probably does, um, she's identifying that it's impacting her both at work and at home, and that she's seeing a psychiatrist to deal with this condition. I don't think that she is entitled to the 12 weeks of federally provided um, protected unpaid leave. But does that mean we don't give her any leave at all? Um, there, I think the answer to that question, um, it, this is where we get into sort of the nuance, right? Um, because although she may not be entitled to FMLA leave, a leave of absence may be an appropriate accommodation if she's an individual with a disability. Um, we know from the case law and from the regulations um, that alcoholism does often rise to the level of a disability under the federal and state law. And so assuming that Andrea is otherwise qualified to perform all of the functions of her job, and we certainly don't have any facts that suggest otherwise, I think the firm would want to provide Andrea with a leave of absence as an accommodation for a potential disability here. So with that said, um, Carrie, what do you think, though, about the performance issues Andrea's been having, including the missed deadlines, not showing up for a court appearance? Is that something that the firm should be disciplining for? And so this is always one of the trickier areas when you're dealing with employees with alcoholism or addiction issues, in that it usually is raised after the employer identifies performance issues and then the employee raises it for the first time at that point. Um, employers are not required to ignore prior performance issues regarding that. And, uh, and as a result, but at the same time though, the guidance does indicate that employers are, have legitimate expectations, that non-discriminatory expectations and requirements that you should not be drinking alcohol in the workplace and you should be sober in the workplace. So this is a, one of those areas where there's a lot of nuance and a lot of gray area and that do we, you, you can hold the individual accountable for the prior misconduct, particularly how egregious it is. Uh, you know, in this instance, what Andrea has done, it's not great, but it's not the most egregious conduct I've ever seen. I'm sure other partners or other attorneys in the firm have probably engaged in similar misconduct and that they've shown up late every now and then because you know, school or what have you, uh, or they missed the filing. Uh, and so consistency is key. If you've held other uh, employees to the same standards, sure, you can, you can hold her accountable to those very same standards and discipline or terminate her. If you haven't, uh, there, and there is case law saying that employers, as part of an accommodation, may need to not necessarily forgive, but to, uh, with prior disciplinary action or prior misconduct, to take it into consideration, put context around it. <laughs> Um, that may be what's appropriate here. And before we take an online question, I would just add to that that, you know, as Carrie mentioned, consistency is really key here. And that's for an important purpose because if all of a sudden the family law firm says, you know, we've never enforced the drinking in the office rule for anyone else, but we're gonna do this here. We're gonna we're gonna lay the hammer down here. That can create a perception that we're suddenly singling Andrea out um, based on the fact that we know she suffers from alcoholism, a, a potential disability under the law. And that's a big problem for an employer because again, it looks like you're treating Andrea differently than all of the other employees that you have in the office. Um, and maybe the only thing different about Andrea is her disabling condition. So that's a problem um, and something that certainly we would not advise an employer to do. And we have a question. Yes, I, I think you've touched on the answer, but the question that came in online uh, is this. Don't you want to first go to the fact that Andrea was drinking at work before she requested leave for, ter uh, for treatment? Yeah, and I think, again, the answer to that is, is yes, assuming that you have enforced that rule um, on a fairly consistent basis for other employees. Again, problematic if suddenly out of nowhere that rule is a big deal when it hasn't been in the past. Um, Aviva. 
Yes. So, <laughs> first of all, we know that under 1.16A2, a lawyer must withdraw from representation if that lawyer cannot um, adequately represent the client because of a physical or, or mental impairment. So alcohol certainly comes within that and she would be required to withdraw from representation. So the other thing that happens um, with, and this is sometimes where I think em, you know, employees need to come forward because they have this ethical obligation. So they need to talk to you know, their supervising attorney. So that's the first part. Um, the next part is that the, the law firm has that obligation under 5.1 to have policies and procedures in place to make sure everybody follows the rules. So part of this may mean that employees will have to disclose information that may be protected. And, and you know, and that we talked about how do you contain that information so that everybody doesn't know. But if you have a, an associate who is working for four or five partners, and those partners are all supervising that associate under 5.1b, those partners probably need to know. Because we know that associates can continue, but one of the things we'll talk about later is that there can be those accommodations to make sure those associates are not violating the rules. And I would add here that luckily the disability laws um, do have a little bit of a safe haven in this regard and they, the laws tell us basically that we can share information with supervisors on a need to know basis. But I would suggest to you that the information that actually needs to be shared is very narrow. So uh, a partner who may be working with associate Andrea in this case doesn't necessarily need to know that she's been diagnosed with alcoholism and that she's seeing a psychiatrist. What the partner needs to know is she's dealing with some personal issues that prevent her from me being able to um, be at work at the time and we need to come up with a plan for addressing that. I don't think it's necessary that you get into all of the nitty gritty details of Andrea's medical condition um, to accomplish that communication obligation. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to another one. Um, this one, we've got Secretary Susie, and she works at a mid-sized private law firm with about 40 employees. She's well-liked by her assigned attorneys and peers, but has a known and diagnosed history of mental health issues, which has resulted in a past suicide attempt and other harm to herself. All of this occurred outside the workplace. During those instances, the firm permitted Susie to obtain treatment and take the time she needed to adjust to her medication. Susie is assigned to one of the firm's most notoriously difficult partners. He is known to yell when he gets upset and has had a history of causing secretaries to quit. Miraculously, Susie has been able to endure as the partner's secretary for several years, and they actually tend to get along well. Approximately two weeks ago, Susie began acting erratically. She made comments to her coworkers about how she may want to harm herself, and she also made comments that the partner was going to be sorry if he yelled at her just one more time. She said he better look over his shoulder at all times. Today, after being yelled at by the partners, Susie becomes hostile. She yells back at him, throwing anything that she can grab, and saying, I should have killed you years ago. Carrie, what do you think are the firm's obligations under the disability laws given this fact pattern? Sure, so I, I do believe that uh, she likely would meet the definition of disabled under both the ADA and WFEA. Uh, mental illness is a recognized disability under both statutes. And uh, here, um, particularly under the, the ADAAA, uh, you know, she may have been in remission or it may have been controlled based on medication, but uh, the broader definition of disability indicates that even if treated by medication or in remission, they can still be disabled under the act. And here she also has had, uh, based on the erratic behavior for two weeks, uh, there's a good argument here that uh, she's no longer, that the condition is no longer being treated medic by medication as well. Now, uh, Lindsay, what do you think the firm's obligation is to accommodate 
Susie's behavior under these circumstances? Yeah, this is a really good question because as you've already established, Carrie, um, I, I think that uh, Susie meets the definition of a disability. And so what we know under the law is that you know, we should accommodate her so long as it's reasonable for us to do so and won't result in an undue hardship. But here, I think there's something that we really strongly need to, to consider, and that's the question of whether Susie's um, behavior in the workplace is posing a direct threat to herself or to others. We know from the fact pattern that she appears to have become, at least you could argue, physically violent, right? She's picking up objects and throwing them in the direction of the notoriously difficult partner. Um, she's also made uh, remarks which could be characterized as threatening as well. Um, she specifically yelled at the partner, I should have killed you years ago. And so based on these facts, I think there's a question in my mind as to whether she does pose a direct threat. And if the answer to that question is yes, then the employer does not necessarily have that accommodation uh, obligation. Um, under the regulations, we know that someone who poses a direct threat um, to themselves or to others um, that cannot be eliminated by a reasonable accommodation, um, you can take disciplinary action or discontinue the employment relationship there. Um, I am just not 100% convinc convinced that that's the case here, though. And so what do I do as an employer when it's sort of blurry, it's on the line? Here is one situation where I think it might be appropriate um, to have Susie undergo a medical evaluation um, and to get a doctor, a professional healthcare provider's opinion as to whether Susie can safely perform the functions of her job without posing a threat to others. So if I represented mid-sized private law firm, what I would recommend to them is that they place Susie on a paid suspension pending the outcome of a medical evaluation armed with information from a professional who's um, you know, skilled and able to assess Susie's ability to be in the workplace, you can make decisions from there, including whether um, you place her on a leave of absence, um, whether you terminate the employment relationship because there is no accommodation that could make her um, someone who can safely work around others, um, or something in between. And so I think that's how I would handle that one. See, and so this is one of these fact patterns where uh, there is a difference. It is so unique and nuanced, and I have the beholder is a little bit of what goes on here. I think I would say she can be terminated. Uh, the distinguishing factor here is that she, in, in addition to the threatening behavior, she threw objects. And so she did create a direct threat of harm to individuals in the workplace. Uh, now that, to me, is the, the one distinguishing factor. Um, that I also view this in the different, in a prism of workplace violence as well, based on my practice in other areas. Uh, and that uh, employers have a duty under the Occupational Safety and Health Act to protect employees from workplace violence. What Susie did here was engage in a definition of workplace violence. And, uh, and OSHA expects, requires employers to have a zero tolerance policy, policy towards workplace violence. And, uh, and so here the employer has a legitimate non-discriminatory reason to be able to terminate the employee based on this. Now would you expect that there would be some challenge from her? Ultimately, likely so. Um, but uh, based on you know, how I view the law and in the circumstances, I have a slightly different perspective from Lindsay on that. Either, either situation and perspective I think is appropriate. It's just a matter of how we want to, how the employer wants to handle it and getting to that, that rationale so that we all have a clear understanding of it. But why, sh so what concerned me about this is that she had this condition before she was assigned to that particular partner. Mm -hmm. And so why wouldn't the firm have had a policy and procedure in place to say, look, when we have somebody with this type of a disability, don't we have an obligation to put them with somebody who won't make it worse? I think it's such a great question. And Carrie and I actually talked about this in preparation because some of the risk here, right, is 
the question in our minds is, is Susie being harassed by right. this partner? Right. And don't we have an obligation to deal with the partner's conduct in this instance as well? And I think the answer to that is yes. Yeah, I think that we need to sort of, <laughs> someone has dealt with difficult partner in this room. I think that we need to be sort of looking at this from all angles. And so, um, you know, it's a good question of, as a form of accommodation, do we have an obligation as an employer to keep Susie away from the partner? <clears throat> maybe, maybe not, right? Their relationship seems to have been going pretty well for most of the time, and that things really got out of control near the end. Um, but I don't think that we want to excuse either party's behavior in this case. I mean, I think certainly um, the firm should be thinking hard about how they're dealing with this particular partner. And frankly, they're at risk that if we terminate Susie's employment here, she comes back with not only a potential disability claim, but also a claim that she has been unlawfully harassed in some way by the partner. Question. And that was, that was most of my question, is there in the definition of workplace violence, throwing is violent and yelling is not violent? Threats of violence are violence under yeah. the definition of workplace violence. No, the yelling partner, so that's not oh, considered uh, violence? It's, it's bullying behavior, yes. yes. Under the definition <laughs> of workplace violence pro provided by OSHA, uh, threats of violence is, falls under that definition. But just Yelling in and of itself does not fall under under that definition. No. Until he threatens in his yelling, threatens Correct. to, you know, I will fire you. Is that a, is the, no? That it would not be, be a threat. That, that would not be workplace violence. violence. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. a good Thank question. You. Yeah. Now I do, and and one thing as well, which Aviv, I'm glad you raised that, is under the fact pattern, the com the firm knew for about two weeks that she was acting a bit erratically. Mm -hmm. We had a question earlier as, can we talk to the employee about this? This is a clear example where yes, we should. And based on the fact that she's been open with us in the past as to what her condition is, she's been receiving treatment, this is a clear example of we should be out in front of this and go to her and say, what's going on? And at that point you can address, is your med you know, have you been taking your medication? What is, you know, have you seen your doctor in the past you know, however, however recently, and you can send a medical questionnaire to a provider to get some more information from that provider as to what the individual's condition is, whether accommodation or leave needs to be provided as a result. Because, you know, one of my concerns is that when you have an employee who has that disability, then they often want to show that that disability doesn't have an adverse impact on their ability to perform their job. And so what they do is they extend themselves. And I could imagine where Susie would probably not want to say, no, I'm not going to work for that partner, because that just says to her, you don't have the ability that other people do. Well, and so to yeah. twist that around, yeah. the perceived as being disabled. Exactly. So you, you don't want to take a decision that is based off, listen, I'm trying to protect you. Mm -hmm. because I perceive that eventually this partner is going to break you down and you're not going right. to be able to handle it. Exactly. So it's, it, that's that fine line right there. It is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, moving forward here. So we have a uh, staff attorney, Stephen, Steve, who works at a, a large private law firm with over 100 employees. He's been employed for the firm, at the firm for 11 years and regularly bills 1850 hours per year. Steve, a member of the firm's labor and employment practice group, is a good employee and has uh, received positive performance evaluations in the past. Uh, the firm employs many other staff attorneys who, like Steve, do not handle ongoing litigation but are responsible for preparing position statements for clients responding to charges of discrimination or harassment or retaliation. Steve, therefore, has regular client contact but does, but does not make court appearances. Recently, Steve took a one-week vacation and while away was arrested for possession of cocaine. When he returns to work, he informs his boss of the arrest, thinking he's being a good employee by being forthright about this. He acknowledges the recreational use of cocaine, but denies ever using the drug at work and denies any form of drug addiction. Uh, Steve, who has exhausted all PTO for the year, re requests an additional two weeks off to meet with his lawyer and attend court appearances. Now, Lindsay, what do you think the firm's obligations under the leave laws are under this? Great question. 
Um, so let's kind of start off, I think, with um, the ADA and the WFEA, so the disability laws. Um, the first question is, is this an individual with a disability? And I think that the answer to that is no. Um, the information that we currently have available to us suggests that Steve is, is a recreational drug user at most. Um, when posed with the question and when engaged in a discussion with Steve, he denied having any addiction to um, cocaine. He denied that it was impacting his um, you know, ability to perform his job or otherwise um, impacting him as basically in his personal life other than the fact that he has um, you know, been arrested and is, is facing these legal issues. Um, and so, you know, the guidance and the regulations for both the ADA and the WFEA uh, suggest to us that an individual who is sometimes using illegal drugs, but that drug use is not substantially limiting their capacity to work um, or making their life unusually difficult is not disabled under the law. So I think you can set to the side the ADA and the WFEA. But let's talk about the FMLA and the Wisconsin FMLA is right. Those are the, the laws that would entitle um, Steve potentially to um, unpaid leave of absence to deal with a serious health condition. Um, again, under those statutes, um, certainly drug addiction could rise to the level of a serious health condition, but that's not what I'm seeing here. And there is no requi requirement under either the FMLA or the WFMLA to extend a leave of absence to an employee to deal with um, criminal or uh, court issues that may be going on. Um, I'll just note, you'll want to check all your state laws if you're, if you're listening in and maybe not practicing Wisconsin, because every state's a little different. Um, but here, I don't think that the disability or the uh, FMLA laws are implicated. I agree with you on that. So then what do you think, um, given all of that, Carrie, about whether, um, w let's say the firm denies the request for leave because there's no legal obligation that they provide it, and Steve takes off the additional two weeks that he needed um, to deal with his criminal issues, should, should the law firm discipline him for that? So it, uh, it depends. Uh, I mean, certainly the, the law firm has attendance. I would imagine the law firm has an attendance policy, requires employees to attend work on a regular basis during set working hours. And, uh, and here, the employer, the firm could enforce those, that rule and issue appropriate discipline up to uh, termination. The key here is consistency and, pa and prior practice. Uh, did the firm, has the firm always treated similar situations like this? Uh, and so, for instance, if other employees have had a DUI, for instance, and they needed time off for court, did the firm provide that? Or other certain types of reasons for leave related to court, were they, were they granted? Uh, now here, the, the risk of discrimination still denying it is, seems to be low, mm -hmm. just because one, don't believe he's disabled under the law. Um, and then two, you know, the, just the other factors that could give rise to a discriminatory discrimination claim just don't seem to be apparent here because uh, he would have to identify a similarly situated individual who engaged in similar misconduct and uh, who was not disciplined. So it just it would be a, a trickier claim for him to bring in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's generally low risk um, to discipline Steve for then taking the two weeks off work if he had exhausted his PTO. Um, let's talk next, though, about let's say the firm does um, grant, grant Steve that additional time off work. They've done it in the past. They want to be consistent here. So they say, sure, Steve, take the two weeks you need. We'll, we'll figure that out. Um, and it turns out that Steve is then convicted um, for this crime of possession of cocaine. Um, can and should the firm terminate him for that? So this is one of the unique Wisconsin laws in that there is, a, under the WFEA, there's protection for arrest and criminal conviction mm -hmm. records. So uh, here the company would need, the firm would need to show that uh, his cocaine use uh, was, is tied to his job duties. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that may be difficult to show under these circumstances. And so as a result, if you were to terminate based off the conviction, 
or based off the arrest, uh, there, there's some exposure there related under the law for a discrimination claim. But if you terminate based off the attendance, mm -hmm. uh, there's far less risk there. Right. So under, first of all, we always think, does the firm have to report him, right, mm -hmm. under 8.3? So misconduct is defined under 8.4b as committing a criminal act. You don't have to be convicted. So first of all, but, so you know that he violated a rule, right? So under 8.3, you have to report another lawyer if you know they violated a rule. And if that violation raises a substantial question about that lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness in other regards, there's the wiggle room, right? So at that point, when he's just been arrested and charged, the firm probably does not have an obligation to report because it may not raise that question of his honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness. Once he's convicted, he, under 21.15, has an obligation to inform Office of Lawyer Regulation and the court of his conviction within that five days of the conviction. So he has to report himself. The question then, can the firm discharge him? Certainly, if he can't perform his work when he's suspended, if he's suspended, then you know that certainly um, permits the firm to take that action, but. Yeah, our ethical guru is spot on as always. Um, and it's correct, even though Wisconsin arrest and conviction law has a carve out that basically says, look, if as a result of this conviction, um, the individual is um, no longer licensed to perform the duties that they provide, that is um, a carve out that allows, allows an employer to take action, including separation from employment. Um, similarly, I think Aviva raised another great point, which is if we learn that the employee, Steve, in this case, um, failed in his obligation to report um, to the state bar the, uh, the criminal issues that he's part of action, that's not actually because of the conviction, but because of the dishonesty associated with it. And you know, I'd just like to raise here is notice all the barriers that we're putting up or that the law puts up to helping lawyers achieve wellness again. And that's part of what the next panel is going to be about. But um, we have all these laws that say you can't do this, you can't do that, but nothing that says, boy, if we want to be good people and, and help our lawyers, we should do certain things. Correct. And, and that's a great point is that there's nothing to, that prohibits employers from going above and beyond. Right. The, uh, the one issue there is precedent. Mm -hmm. If you're going above and beyond for this individual, should be expected to go above and beyond for future individuals. And, I think you got to this one, but the online question was, what about liability for arrest and conviction record discrimination? Yeah, I, I yeah. think that we have addressed that. Yeah. Um, and certainly in Wisconsin in particular, employers are prohibited from um, making employment decisions on the basis of an arrest or conviction record um, unless you can demonstrate, demonstrate that a conviction is substantially related to the, the position held. So that's a difficult burden to make um, and one that usually we advise you consult with legal counsel before um, pulling the trigger on that. Um, Tom, how are we feeling about time? I know that it's really important to keep on, on task You're at these. You're almost out. Okay, <laughs> so there is one more hypothetical in the materials. Um, both the outline and the PowerPoint slides have all of that information available. Um, I think if we were just to sort of punchline the main takeaways from that one, um, you know, I think that in particular, anxiety and stress are, are issues that come up in workplaces and for employees um, very, very often. And what we wanted to emphasize through this hypothetical and, and that will quickly sort of cliff notes for you is that generally speaking, um, just sort of what I would characterize as run of the mill work related stress is not usually going to rise to the level of a disability. Um, the answer is different if an individual has been diagnosed with um, a particular mental health condition such as depression, PTSD, severe anxiety. Under those circumstances, that condition likely will rise to the level of a disability and a serious health condition. And as a result of that, the employer will have obligations even for its attorneys um, to provide 
accommodations and potentially a leave of absence. Um, so it's difficult to distinguish between one is something just work-related stress that most employees um, will experience at some point in their careers versus when do we get into the actual um, qualifying disability or serious health condition. And you know, this is where the ethics sort of departs because if that lawyer is not capable of representing that client under 1.16 A2, that lawyer has to be, has to withdraw and certainly the firm, but you can see the firm saying, look, we're gonna make you continue, right? And he's saying, I can't do it. And so the firm could be vicariously liable for that ethics violation under 5.1C. Yeah, and I think that's when you're really seriously considering a, a medical leave of absence as yeah. an appropriate approach there. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Carrie, Lindsay, and Aviva, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank much you. appreciated. Uh, a little less than 10 minutes. We'll come back at 11.15. It's about 11.07 right now. Thanks. Carrie and I are here.
All right, we're back, uh, 11.15 as promised, uh, one more hour to go. Uh, I just wanna remind everyone uh, first here in the room uh, that you have an evaluation form in the back of your booklet. Um, if you uh, are so inclined, we would love for you to fill that out for us. Uh, we listen to your comments very carefully and we uh, take them into consideration for future programs. Uh, we wanna do these things as well as we can. So uh, we would appreciate a, uh, a chance to look at your, your comments and evaluations of today's program. For those of you online, you will get an email and you will have the same opportunity. So again, um, we always appreciate uh, the feedback uh, so that we can continue to do these things better. And we also like to hear about topics that you'd like to hear about in the future. So, hour number three, and I will turn it over to Mary Spranger. Hi, good morning, I'm Mary Spranger. I'm manager of the Wisconsin Lawyers Assistance Program. Um, I'll be moderating today, and I also have on our panel, you've already met um, Ariva Meridian Kaiser, Ethics Counsel of the State Bar. Also, we have on my right, Katya Kunska, the President and CEO of Wisconsin Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company. Katya joined Wilmic in 1989 as head of the Claims Department and held that position until 2003. Katya served for seven years as a member of the ABA Standing <laughs> Committee on Lawyers Professional Liability and sat on the Property and Casualty Conference Board excuse me, of the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies from 2011 to 2012. She is also a member of the State Bar of Wisconsin and the Dane County Bar Association. She sits on the board of directors for the National Association of Bar-Related Insurance Companies. And on Katja's right, we have Eve Dorman, who is the Dane County Legal Director for Permanency Planning. She's a 1996 graduate of DePaul University College of Law. Prior to attending law school, she earned a master's degree in social work and practiced in that field with seriously emotionally and behaviorally disturbed foster children in Chicago beginning in 1990. As an attorney, she has continued her commitment to child welfare practice, serving for almost four years as regional counsel for the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services in juvenile court in Chicago. After relocating to Madison, she began working for the Dane County Corporation Counsel's Office in 2003, prosecuting CHIPS and TPR petitions. Ms. Dorman has also volunteered for WISLAP since 2010 as a peer mentor and monitor. She is focused on work-life balance and managing mental health while working in an emotionally challenging field. So thank you to all of our panelists for agreeing to be present with us today. And I also want to thank Dr. Lindemann for her efforts to help us understand um, one definition of well-being. I think as we were preparing for this presentation, it's kind of hard to conceptualize what that is, what that means to different people, because there's a continuum. Um, the purpose of our panel is to kind of explore this concept of attorney wellness through several different lenses, kind of incorporating what we heard from Dr. Lindemann, what we heard from the last panel, and have our panelists give their viewpoint on, on a few of the different topics. So our, as we talk about our task today, we're really trying to solve a problem, right? But before we can solve the problem, we need to define it. And if we rush to a definition, we end up with an impoverished solution base. So we really would like this to be a discussion about how we can define the problem. And Dr. Lindemann did a good job of starting to define wellness, and I've spent lots of time talking to Mary, and she does a great job with it as well. So, so one of the reasons for this panel, um, number one is the support of the Young Lawyers Division in trying to, to move this discussion forward. We know from the statistics that Dr. Lindemann quoted that lawyers are in trouble in terms of their well-being. The study that she quoted, along with another one on law student wellness, um, led to the creation of this report, The Path to Lawyer Well-Being. This was pretty significant in our field because it was several professionals along with the ABA saying, all right, well now we have all this data on lawyer impairment, people are really concerned about these numbers, now what are we going to do about it? And it was really the first time that people decided to kind of come together in a concerted way to make some recommendations about what working in the law could look like. What has it looked like? What has it produced? And what should we be thinking about for the future? It's a large report. Um, there's topics in there that are very general and broad about things like uh, lawyer civility and work-life balance that don't have easy solutions, but they've led to the beginning of a conversation. There's also more specific recommendations for 
bar associations, lawyer assistance programs, regulators, um, law schools, and so forth. So that's really uh, behind a lot of our discussion when we conceptualize lawyer well-being these days. And when we talk about lawyer well-being, what we're really talking about are the very many dimensions uh, that go into a lawyer's overall well-being. We're not just talking about physical health or mental health. We're talking about how someone feels in relationship to their job. We're talking about their spiritual practice, uh, their social relationships, the balance in their life, their connectedness with other people. There's many, many factors that factor into that. So we're not just talking about is someone physically fit or mentally stable. We're not talking about does this attorney um, have an absence of illness, but we're really talking about having a positive state of mental health and wellness in all facets of a lawyer's life. Um, however, that brings up a lot of questions, and these are ones that we don't all have a lot of answers to. I mean, when we talk about wellness, when we're talking about competence, what does that mean? At what point does someone who is, I don't know, sleep deprived or anxious or grieving over the death of a loved one, and, that, and those symptoms affect their occupational performance, is that a temporary problem? Is that a, um, at what point does somebody intervene? At what time does it become problematic? If the person is not well, but they're performing okay in the context of their occupation, are we concerned about that? Um, those are some of the questions we want to talk about today. So the, my part of this was saying, can we use our rules of professional conduct as strategies to maintain wellness and to prevent any incapacitation? On the other hand, do they become a barrier to achieving that or maintaining that wellness. So that's what we're going to talk about. That way you get ethics credit, right? We're going to start there. So the first thing was, you know, understanding what those rules are about, the scope of them, right? They're designed to provide guidance. They're designed to help us regulate our conduct. Um, they're not designed for civil liability. And so we want to be cautious about that. I want to shift that focus to providing that guidance. Um, and I highlighted here that a rule is a just basis for lawyer self-assessment. And that's what we have to look at. Um, if anybody calls me on the hotline, I will always say probably, look, you can't use it as a sword or a shield, right? It is for disciplinary purposes. But that doesn't mean that we can't use it to change the culture. Um, Unfortunately, what the rules give, they take away and say that even though um, they're not, they don't establish standards of conduct, a lawyer's violation, it could be proof of a breach of conduct. So it's not always perfect. But let's talk about competence for a minute, right? Now, Dr. Lindemann, what did she give us? She gave us skills. And notice the competence rule says a lawyer shall provide competent representation. What's it include? Legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation that's necessary for the representation. So I want to think about, is our wellness part of that competence? What do we know how this has changed now? Think about. Um, that comment eight to this rule that was recently enacted, um, what's it require us to be competent now? Technology, right? So why shouldn't wellness be in there? Um, but remember that what we have to do in comment one explains that um, it depends on the nature of the matter. So. What that, that should give us hope, right? That there are some matters that if a lawyer has some impairment, that lawyer can be competent in that matter, maybe not in other matters. So again, it gives us a way to help our lawyers still maintain their practice. Um, so, and I will give us plenty of time to get through other things, but here again it says, how many of you knew that, that the amount of preparation and thoroughness is directly related to what's at stake. So if we have lawyers that have some health issues, can we assign them other things that there might not be as much at stake to help you know, them achieve wellness? Um, again, there's that comment eight that says, well, you have to be 
you know, competent and relevant technology. So that gets us to what Virginia just did on October 31st of this year. It amended its comment to the rules of professional conduct to the competency rule. And look at this. A lawyer's mental, emotional, and physical well-being impacts that lawyer's ability to represent clients and to make responsible choices in the practice of law. Maintaining the mental, emotional, and physical ability necessary for the representation of a client is an important aspect of maintaining competence to practice. The only state right now that has this one, but it may be something that Wisconsin should con should um, consider, right? So, uh, can we talk to a minute about? Um, sure. I'd like to talk a little bit to Katya about your thoughts about attorney wellness and and whether that is an element of competence when you're considering malpractice cases. No, sadly, no. The uh, standard of care requires that you all be really good all the time, and <laughs> nobody is. I'm not really good every day. So um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it is not considered, it's not a defense, it's, um, it's certainly an issue that we care about, mm -hmm. but, but the, the standard of care is pretty heartless in that regard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then even in your role, is that something that comes into play with the people that you work with? And it is, and I think a, a big part of that is um, the work that we do. It is very emotionally challenging work, and I am fortunate to, um, be employed by an employer and in a work setting with um, management and supervisory staff who recognize that the work is emotionally challenging. And as a result, I think we are um, at least cognizant of the fact that attorneys um, are more likely to experience burnout, they're more likely to experience compassion fatigue, they are more likely to run into a case that they just for whatever reason, their own history or the particular facts of a case, they may just not be able to deal effectively with where they are too emotionally involved or in some cases where they defend themselves emotionally by taking too far of a step back. And so um, that's something that we pay attention to. I don't know that we have connected that conversation as directly to the rules of professional conduct around competence as we're doing here today. So I'm really interested to continue that conversation, but we have um, in our office recognized wellness as being really important for our staff, um, mostly because of the nature of the work that we do. So that really contrasts with some of what we were hearing in the previous presentation. Right. Mm -hmm. I wanted to give you an opportunity too, Eve, to talk a little bit about kind of your personal experience early on in your practices to now and kind of how you came to that <laughs> kind of conclusion in your office, because I don't know that it's necessarily typical. Right, and I, I think part of it for me, it's been a, an area of interest in my practice um, in part because of my background as well in social work. And what I will say is that um, social workers are given a fair amount of education about how to um, maintain wellness and sort of protect themselves emotionally from the burden of the work with people who are struggling uh, because it, it can be a very heavy burden. And certainly that's, it, at least in my experience 30 years ago, that was not something that was touched on at all in law school, and I don't think that has changed very much in terms of law school education. But in our adversarial system, we necessarily have conflict. And where you have conflict, you have emotion, and sometimes you have negative emotion. And, it, and I, I find that lawyers often walk into those conflicts without recognizing where their own uh, personal baggage may impact how they respond to a client or how they respond um, to a litigation strategy. So I know for myself, when I first started practicing as a lawyer, it was in Cook County in Chicago. Um, it was, the expectations were really high. Um, we also didn't make much money. So as a young lawyer, I was working two jobs. My main job uh, for DCFS, I was in court um, six to seven hours a day and then expected to do all the out of court work in the rest of the time. I typically saw both sunrise and sunset from my office window. I was one of the lucky ones, I had a window. Um, but I spent a lot of time there. Um, I tried in, you know, again, as a, as a youngster, you don't really know that much about self-care anyway when it hasn't been talked about much. So I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll keep working out and that'll be a good way to sort of manage my stress. Well, I was working out six and seven days a week. Um, not really leaving myself time to eat or sleep. And so it got to a point where it, it affected my health. I was underweight. Um, I was not, um, I was anemic because I wasn't getting proper nutrition. 
Um, the other thing that, that happened for me was in hindsight, I recognize now I did struggle with depression. I had days when I could not get out of bed and I would call in sick to work. And I was responsible for a courtroom and so that wasn't, that wasn't great for my employer or for my cases or for my courtroom, for me just suddenly not to be there and have somebody have to cover for me. Um, it, was, it was a struggle. Now, I wasn't disciplined. I was doing my job and you know everybody has a day when they call in sick, but I knew that it wasn't because I had a cold. It was because I couldn't get out of bed to face the job on a particular day. And so when I moved to Wisconsin, I had an opportunity to take a break from work. Um, and I really did some thinking and some self-reflection about what that meant. And as I got back into the child welfare work here in Wisconsin, I made some conscious choices about different decisions on how to manage my physical health, how to manage my emotional health. Um, and I've tried to carry that over into our workplace and with my young lawyers, I really support them in, let's talk about how you feel about these cases. It's okay to say, you know, I might talk to a therapist. I myself, I go back for therapy boosters periodically. It's, it's helpful in continuing to manage that and making that an okay part of the conversation and the recognition that in order to do the work that we do competently, we've gotta be able to approach it with a clear head and not be tied so much into the emotion of the cases that's very real, so. I appreciate that and I appreciate you sh you're sharing your story and I appreciate you normalizing that conversation for your attorneys because until we are able to have that conversation, conversation without the shame and the stigma that has accompanied it all the way, those statistics are not gonna budge. So. And, and that's one of the things that I also try to do with the law students that work with us. They, they come in not knowing what Corporation Council does and not knowing that this is a big part of our practice and it's great litigation experience, so a lot of them want to do the litigation and get into court, but I, I have a conversation with them. You may hate this work you may discover that this work is not for you and that is okay, you are a student right now, this is a good time to figure that out. Um, but let's keep talking about it. If you find yourself having emotional reactions to this case, these cases, let's talk about that. And so it's, we're trying to do that with the students too. And that's so, competence right there. There, there right? it is. So we talked earlier about when lawyers have to decline or withdraw from representation. And the one that's at focus here is A2, which says the lawyer's physical or mental condition, notice this, materially impairs the lawyer's ability to represent the client. And the reason I wanted to point out in this session about materially impairing is because, again, while this looks like a bar, we can use that language to actually, as a strategy, to say, well, how can we help our lawyers continue to represent when they may have you know, some impairment issues, but being able to work helps them, right? Right, and I, I guess I'm just struck by, and we haven't had a chance to really go through it, and it's a continuing conversation, that impairment piece, right? right. Is it impairment to recognize that you're having you know, a reaction to a client that's entirely appropriate and that you can, you can talk about in a productive way, does that really constitute an impairment or is that a coping strategy? I think it's a coping strategy. What do you think? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that in, in our work, it's, it's realistic to have emotional reactions to yes. the cases. Where, it where I think it becomes an impairment is where you make choices in your litigation strategy that are driven by your emotion as opposed to your professional competence as an attorney. And so where, for example, I have a, a client, a, a, a parent on my caseload who's not making the progress they need to make in order to have their children return to their care and I need to file a petition to terminate parental rights. But I'm old in my office now and I've been around a long time and this particular parent is someone that I had as a kid on my caseload. And so I know their history and I know where they came from and I know why they struggle to parent their kid and I hesitate to file that petition to terminate their rights to their kid because it feels so punitive when they had such a difficult childhood. My obligation is to the public interest and um, often to the children who need permanency in their lives. I can't hesitate to file that petition because I feel bad for that parent. And so that's a conversation, that's an example of one of the conversations that we might have in our office. And if we had an attorney who sort of routinely said, mm, I'm not gonna file that petition because I know where that parent came from, I think 
that begins to become an issue of, of competence and the ability to, an impairment in the ability to effectively represent the client. That's right, helpful. and it's a conflict of interest because we don't think about our conflicts being, if you look at 1.7A2, it says, are, is there a significant risk that you'll be materially limited by your own personal interest? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we have to look at is what that personal interest is. Um, so the ABA issued an opinion in 2003 that basically sets forth three mm -hmm. duties that um, a, a firm has with an impaired lawyer. And we're going to talk about all three of them, but the first one, if you notice, the obligation to adopt measures to prevent an impaired lawyer from violating the rules. And I think that's a strategy. It is not punitive. We can have those policies and procedures in place. And then the opinion talks about what are the obligations when an impaired lawyer has violated the rules, what do you have to do? And you may be surprised about some of that. And then what are the obligations when that impaired lawyer is no longer in the firm? And, and this is, you know, a lot of these still can be strategies to help our lawyers. So the first thing I want to talk about is the preventative policies and procedures. 5.1a, we talked a little bit about that earlier, it says that all lawyers, you know, in the firm who have managerial authority, so if you have a management committee and you have an associate on that committee, that associate has managerial authority, comes within this role. And they have to establish those internal policies and procedures that it will not guarantee that all the lawyers are going to follow the rules, but give that reasonable insurance. Again, it's reasonableness, not a guarantee. Um, so when we do that, we have to keep in mind, too, that it's the size of the firm and the nature of the practice. So if you have a practice, you know, like Eve was talking about, that's really an emotionally laden practice, then you want to have different policies and procedures, and the discussions you're talking about are really crucial there. Um, I okay. would, just for one second, yeah. I just wanted to ask you a little bit, Katya, about you know any you know claims or, or information you have kind of in that regard about things that you see that things people could be doing better or differently. Well, first of all, the the firms that we insure are primarily sole practitioners, so mm -hmm. it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, your 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 right brain isn't going to tell your left brain to um, <laughs> you know to assign this hard thing that you can't do well because you can no longer be objective mm -hmm. because your your history makes you make subjective responses. It, our lawyers don't have that opportunity. And then the other firms that we insure are, you know, up to five lawyers, mm -hmm. five, six lawyers. We have few large firms. This isn't something that I could say anecdotally yes, consistently no. Okay. Right. That's helpful. But you know, when Dr. Lindemann talked about insight, right, that skill mm -hmm. of looking back and saying that's precisely what we're doing there is looking and saying what are our experiences that's causing us to react a certain way. Well I think yeah. that's why this is so important. Most of the lawyers in Wisconsin practice by themselves. Right. So waiting for policies and procedures that will you know recognize when you have an issue it's just not going to happen. Right. You know the only person who's going to rescue you is you're going to have to rescue yourself. And I think that's why doing this wellness work is, is really important. And I get that we became lawyers to be helpful and that helpers don't want any stinking help. I, I don't ask for directions. I hate help. But, but, but I committed to help other people. And you've committed to help other people. And if you can't take care of your wellness for yourself, think of it as what you need to do to do your competent, good, excellent job that that you wanted to do in the first place don't do it for yourself if, if you won't give yourself that gift fine mm -hmm. but give it to your clients Good. right that that virginia piece about wellness is a, a core competency mm -hmm. um we may see more of that it sounds like as more people come around to that way of thinking yeah, yeah an online comment i mean this looks like a follow-up to what katya just said and and the the online web viewer writes um, um in your years of uh, addressing claims from policyholders, do you often or sometimes find that it's because they waited too long to address mental health issues? And if so, I guess this is more than to the panel, what should lawyers be thinking about in dealing with that? We certainly suspect that. Um, we don't ask them directly. It doesn't make a difference in terms of standard of care, but 
Sure, absolutely. Our, our, uh, most of our claims are against good lawyers who have too much to do, too much going on. They can't keep all those balls in the air and one of them falls. Right. One of the things I would add from the Whistlap perspective is just that if a lawyer suspects that there's something going on, you're not required to achieve a diagnosis before you can contact Whistlap. Part of our job is to help with that analysis and to help figure out what's going on with an attorney, and that's a confidential conversation, of course, that's not reported to OLR or the bar or anyone else. The, the job of the attorney at that point would be to call and talk to one of the two licensed mental health professionals and say, you know, these are the things I'm doing and seeing, what do you think? That's what we're here for. So Eve, do you have, you had mentioned earlier about policies and procedures in your office or? So we, we don't have as specific a policy or procedure as I, as we probably should. Um, what we do have is a fairly um, solid supervisory structure. And so I sit down with, with the attorneys under my supervision about once a month, we review all the cases. It gives me an opportunity to see um, how they're analyzing the progress of the case and what their litigation strategy is. And it gives me an opportunity to see if emotional elements are creeping in that we need to discuss and talk about. Um, my chain of command, we, Dane County has an employee handbook. They have, they've made the commitment to really good health insurance coverage. So um, the conversation about wellness is becoming more common throughout uh, all of the agencies of Dane County. And um, the handbook talks about time off that's available to treat, you know, certainly consistent with the, um, the various leave acts and the, and the ADA. Um, we're entitled to time off to treat disabilities or conditions that could lead to disabilities. Um, the insurance coverage for those services, including <coughs> mental health ser services, is, is really quite good. And so that, that gives us a, a foundation to be able to have those conversations. Um, but in terms of our office, the, the Corporation Counsel's office, I don't know that we have specific written procedures at this point. But the, the gist of it is that policies and procedures then could be seen as a strategy as opposed right. to a barrier if done correctly. Now what you do in a, in a firm with one or two people, that's another, that's another issue, right. right? And what E just said, which is the second thing, is having those direct that direct supervision. So that's 5.1B, which requires that lawyer, which is when Eve is supervising other lawyers, um, to make sh reasonable efforts to ensure that that lawyer that she's supervising conforms to the rules. And this is one of those places where um, if you have a great relationship with the lawyers you're supervising, oftentimes you can spot things earlier on that can be helpful. Um, the, the problem is that when you know that the lawyer you're supervising has an issue, then your responsibility as the supervisor requires you to, be, to have closer scrutiny of that employer, and that's hard. Um, but we always have those conversations by saying, look, you're prote I'm protecting your license as well mm -hmm. as mine. So, um, is, the, is that something that, that comes up frequently at all, that supervision piece? No, because we insure the law firm, so we, we have the liability, whether it was the impaired lawyer who committed malpractice or whether it was the supervising lawyer who didn't help the impaired lawyer not commit malpractice. Right. Okay. And you can see from that conversation that there's a lack of incentive for law firms to really take care of the lawyers when they're in the firm. I mean, they, in other words, there's that tension, right? You want to say, well, you're not doing a good job. We don't want liability. Let's get rid of them, right? As opposed to let's work with you and help you achieve wellness or not. Well, I hope not. I hope not as well. <laughs> but um, when you look at the rules here, if we look at them as that barrier and you look at malpractice as saying, well, there's no... Um, exception for a lawyer who's having difficulty. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't come into the standard. Well, there isn't a human being out there that isn't having difficulty. If you start <laughs> flicking off all the people with problems, you're going to be a very lonely person. Right, right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, <laughs> I, I will say that in our office, um, in addition to the child welfare practice, we have a, a, a general civil practice representing the county in its civil capacity. and. Um, the 
the head of the office has at times made decisions to shift people's work responsibilities um, away from child welfare into the more general civil practice as a means of, um, at times it's at, a, at the request of the attorney who says, you know, I'm getting burned out, I, I need to do something different for a while, and at times it's at the direction of the Corporation Counsel who determines from her supervision of the office that this person needs to work on some different things. So when you talk about structuring the workload to, uh, we, we conceptualize it in terms of playing to people's strengths, you know, who's, who's good at what things, and, and sometimes people are really good at things that are heavy emotionally, and other times people are not. And so because of the nature of the work in the Corporation Counsel's Office and the variety of work that we do, we do have some opportunity to, to match um, skill sets of attorneys with the kind of work that needs to be done. So with that strategy, you're really Im avoiding impairment. And when I look at this next piece of the slide, when I see the word impaired lawyer, it kind of makes me so uncomfortable because the whole point is to keep people from getting to that point, right? It's to structure the rules in such a way that someone who begins to struggle with wellness can put up their hand and say, there's some sort of intervention that I need so that I don't become an impaired lawyer, right? And when, when I was working on these slides um, and, and in the presentation in general, I kept wanting to say a lawyer who suffers an impairment was even better than impaired lawyer, because at some point all of us suffer some kind of an impairment, but once you say you're an impaired lawyer, it's hard to come back from that, I right. think. The stigma attaches immediately. Right. Um, so 5.1c is a frightening role because um, if a law firm doesn't have those policies or has those policies and procedures in place and a lawyer still violates the rule, then that firm or you know the partners in the firm or the supervisor can be vicariously liable for the lawyer's violation um, if they either ordered it or if they knew about it at the time when they could have avoided the consequences or mitigated those consequences or if they failed to take remedial action. What that means is, and this is where, I, and I probably didn't articulate it well enough when we were in the other panel, is that um, I think it's hard for a supervisor not to know some specific things because this rule says, look, if, if that supervisor didn't take remedial measures or failed to do something to mitigate, that supervisor is going to, to suffer those ethical, that ethical violation. Um, so again, and because often when violations are charged, they'll charge multiple ones. 8.4a says it's misconduct to assist another in violating the rules. So um, having said that, though, <laughs> you're giving me that look. <laughs> Say something positive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying to. But what, so can these rules be a stick? They're not always going to be a carrot, but can they be a stick to encourage changing law firm culture? Can we use them in a positive way? So I did try to do something positive, which is um, accommodation of some impairments. You can do that, and a lot of firms don't understand that. that Yes, depending on how severe or the, what the consequences or what the impairment is, um, the law firm can allow that lawyer to continue to practice with, you know, appropriate supervision. So, and that is the, the good thing. Um, can I ask a question? Real sure. Quick? One of my questions, and I'm the only non-lawyer on the panel, so you you guys can laugh at me for not knowing this, but I keep you know hearing about the term reasonable accommodations for impairments, and I'm really struggling with what's who decides what's reasonable, right? How, I get calls about that sometimes. People will call and say, you know, I have this concern. I want to take it to my employer. I need to ask for some accommodations. What do you think is reasonable? Right. Um, and in, a, in an office culture, <laughs> what, what does that look like? Well, any thoughts on that? I mean, what's, you know, being moved from another, from one office where that kind of litigation is too emotionally taxing, that seems like um, great management strategy. That doesn't seem like accommodating an impairment to me. Um, but that's not always an option for people. Sometimes people's jobs require them to do a certain kind of work. And I think we saw the two employment lawyers, you know, Carrie and Lindsay, talk about that because they were really reluctant to suggest that 
moving people around was the accommodation. Right, and, and I don't yeah. know that I think that shifting the workload is an, is an accommodation of impairment. I think in the context of our office, we are attempting to prevent the right, impairment right, right. by matching people's skills and abilities um, where they fit the best with the work that needs to be done. Um, I, I do know of uh, some occasions where we have had to deal with someone who actually did have a disability or an impairment, and our accommodations have often looked like um, you know, ensuring that people had the ability to take time off for treatment, um, ensuring that uh, an employee maybe uh, could take regular breaks during the day to assist with um, some emotional or mental health kinds of issues. Um, you know, I, I don't think that, certainly not within our legal office in the last 15 or 20 years, we haven't, I don't think, had to deal with lawyers who'd actually reach the state of being impaired, but I imagine that accommodations, you know, would, in, would include primarily opportunities for treatment and follow-up care. Thank you. Just mm -hmm. So some of the examples that I found in doing some research was that, you know, a lawyer could be, do research rather than doing jury trials, and we saw that, and I picked this because we, that last hypothetical that Carrie and Lindsay were going to do, um, but, um, you know, the problem I get when I talk to firms about this on the hotline is they will say to me, we can't afford to have somebody who just is limited mm -hmm. like that. And that's what I was talking earlier about then what the firms do, because the firms then can look at the rules and say, well, this lawyer can't function, so they can't represent under 1.16A2, so you don't have a job now, and that's the frightening part. Um, be, and along with this is you can't charge the client for that extra level of supervision. Mm -hmm. So it does harm the bottom line there. And even in government work, you can probably see that governments don't have a lot of money now. So, you know, shifting workload can cause issues there as well. I want to add something sure. here. I, I tried to do the work that you do, mm -hmm. and my own history prevented me from being a good advocate and an objective lawyer. And I would, I would handle these chips cases, and and I would come to the conclusion that the best solution that I would recommend to the judge was that the kid come home with me, <laughs> which <laughs> really is not an available option. So yeah. I went to an insurance company, and I've had a wonderful career. I've been working in insurance for. 34 years, and for me to use my law license to be the mother that I wanted to be, the lawyer that I wanted to be, that was how, that was my accommodation. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as an employee, you may not have those choices within the firm or within the place that you work, but you do have the option usually to walk away and start somewhere else, and I think you just need to keep that in mind. There, there are those of us that do well with numbers. I'm not one of those. You know, some of us do well with people. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I. Well, and I, I think that's one of the reasons why I, it's important, I believe, to ensure that law school curriculums start talking about this when we have law students who are thinking yes. about where do they want to practice, how do they want to practice. You know, I hope they're in, I'd like to see law students encouraged to try a number of different practice fields through, you know, I love uh, University of Wisconsin's um, internships and sort of their law in action programs where I went to law school, we didn't have as much of that. And I think it's wonderful because I think kids should try different um, fields. I mean, one of the things that I like about having students in our office is, as I said, we have access to a number of different different types of work, whether it's um, employment law or zoning or, um, you know, we represent the airport, we represent the zoo. So we have a number of different options for people to try and they can come in and say, you know, I really thought I wanted to be a labor and employment lawyer, but eh, I don't like this. It's like, great, that's important information for you to have before you go out and take your first job in a labor and employment firm. You know, so I, I think it's important to look at law school curriculums and really help students match their skill sets to jobs where they're going to thrive. Yeah. So that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so that we looked at that. Um, what happens when you have an impaired lawyer in the firm? Do you have to report that? We always think about 
you know, three, um, fondly known as the squeal rule, um, says that you have an obligation to report another lawyer um, who's violated the rules. So if that lawyer is impaired and cannot represent a client, that's a 1.16A2 violation. Now, once that happens, does that raise a substantial question of the lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness? And usually the courts have said yes. But does that mean the firm has to report? Not necessarily. So there's some interesting cases that say, well, if this lawyer violated the rules, but now that lawyer's getting help, that lawyer may not now fall into that category. And so if that's the case, you don't have to report. I almost want you to say that again. Sure. <laughs> so because I think what, what I'm not hearing in this discussion is what possible incentive does an impaired attorney or someone who is struggling have to come forward with any of this? And because so that's once you know, they come forward and they're getting the help they need, then that violation is no longer continuing. Mm -hmm. And they no so then there's no necessity of the firm to report. Mm -hmm. And so for us as, you know, helpers in this profession, one of the things we can say is come to us, get help, and then at that point, um, if they're helping themselves, they don't have to report. Now here's the problem. If you've got a lawyer who's violated the rules and they're not getting help and they're continuing, at that point you do have to report. So there's the incentive there. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and then um, what happens under 5.2 is the subordinate lawyer rule. And we get a lot of calls about this where a subordinate lawyer will know that their partner has an impairment issue. It's very difficult because that subordinate lawyer knows that they're bound by the rules regardless of whether they're being told by a boss to do certain things. Um, and the standard is that um, you can be bound by your superiors, um, dic you know, whatever it's dealing with as long as it's a reasonable resolution of an arguable question of professional conduct. So there's two parts to that. So if my partner tells me to do something, I have to say, well, is it a reasonable resolution of an arguable question of professional conduct? If it's not arguable, then it doesn't matter what the resolution is. So then the subordinate lawyer has to report. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, and I certainly had that issue when I was with my firm in Chicago, which was a, you know, a substantial size firm. And I went to the manager of the firm thinking that would be enough. And it wasn't, of course, now that I know, but I think statute of limitations is run, so I'm good. Uh, since it was 40 years ago, I think I'm OK. Um, but you know, what do you do? And where, how do we help those younger lawyers? Because there, it's usually cognitive impairment rather than other issues. Mm -hmm. But, um, and here's where it says, if the mental condition has caused the violation ended, no may, report may be required. So that's in your materials as well. Good. Any other things that you wanted to add? Because I wanted to make sure we got everything. Sure, sure. Katya, what haven't we covered in your view that you think it's important for these lawyers to know? What have we missed? <laughs> I think you need to fire the bad clients <laughs> because they're wrecking your quality of life. Talk more about that. Well, I, I, it, I could change the way I practice, but, but established lawyers can't always do that in their community. They are the lawyer. Mm -hmm. But there are points in time at which you can say to a client, you know, I just don't, you need help that I am not able to give you all of what you need, I know somebody who can. I think it's really important to refer those people out because it's mm -hmm. the 80-20 rule, you know? It, uh, get rid of them. It's mm -hmm. what, what you're doing and how you do it and how you feel about how you do it is huge. And you can't be good at what you do if you're held hostage to um, unreasonable people, policies, um, rules. Figure it out. You're you're very smart people. You can you can make it better. You can't make it perfect, but you can make it better. Mm -hmm. Eve, any other thoughts as we wind it down? 
I just think it's really important to commit to wellness for yourself. You know, make time for the exercise. Make sure you get enough sleep. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have a social network that supports you outside of the law. Um, make sure you, you take time for the things that restore your soul because the being a helper all the time is draining and it doesn't matter if you're dealing with the the clearly emotionally charged cases involving you know abused and neglected children but you know litigation around significant amounts of money or around who's going to get the house and all of those involve a lot of emotion particularly from your clients and so um, managing all of that is draining and so it's really important to to recognize what restores your soul and to take advantage of the opportunities to do that and to really connect that that's how you help prevent an impairment. It's not just a good idea, it's, it's really a necessary part of your practice. Right. Do we have any questions from the audience at all, either here or online? Nothing online at the moment. Okay. So the only other thing that I wanted to, sort of some wrap up is, when you have an impaired lawyer in the firm that can't continue, under 1.4, the firm has an obligation to, to communicate with the client about that. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to tell everything. And oftentimes, lawyers suffer health problems. And all you say to the client is, look, you know, attorney so-and-so has been working on your matter uh, because of health issues or personal issues, cannot continue. You know, we've reassigned your matter to so-and-so. If you have any questions, please, you know, let us know. And you can sell it that way. But again, we shouldn't be afraid to do that, to protect our lawyer. Um, if the impaired lawyer had violated the rule and the matter is no longer pending, um, then the question becomes, does somebody else in the firm have a responsibility to mitigate? Um, so you do want to go back and look at the files that the lawyer worked on as well. All right. Uh, well, let's give the panel a good round of applause. That was a very good discussion. Uh, a reminder, you can leave your evaluation forms out at the registration desk. Your online folks, you'll be, uh, you'll be getting an email. Um, I want to thank the YLD, Young Lawyers Division, and also the State Bar again for uh, helping put this together with us at Wilmick. Uh, thanks very much. Have a great day, and happy holidays to everyone.